Council Budget Committee meeting and Board of Education meeting to order 6.30 p.m. Thursday, April 30th, 2020. Uh, as the public knows, we are um, doing these through via te te video teleconferencing, uh, which is through youtube.com channel UC4. Uh, I think we've tried to do the best to get that information out so most of the community can watch this. It's the best alternative we have to uh, our in-person meetings. I wanna thank everyone here. I see we have a bunch of Board of Ed members town council members, staff members, et cetera. So thank you all for being here. I know we're all working really hard during these tough times to try to come up with a difficult budget that serves this community <coughs> well. And uh, that's really what the bulk of this conversation is gonna be about tonight. We have got a couple of town council actions, uh, but the majority of it's gonna be uh, budget related for the 2021 budget. So thank you all for being here and welcome to the public who is watching. I hope there's many of you out there that are because this is such a difficult budget in light of what's going on. We need as much engagement as possible in light of the fact that we can't meet face to face. And so hopefully uh, we'll continue to do our best to get your uh, engagement in this. So thank you all. With that, I'll call for roll call. Uh, Ms. Uh, Talbot. <clears throat> You're on mute, Arnett. You're muted, Arnett. You could wish wish you could do that all the time, huh? Yeah, my wife does that to me all the time. Don't worry. <laughs> Let's try again. Mr. Borowie? Present. Mr. Jenks? Here. Ms. Nichols? Here. Chairman Orris? Here. Mr. Slocum? Here. Mr. Talbot? Here. Mr. Velliber? And Mr. Walsh, I see him. Here. Okay. Um, Mr. Chairman, we have a quorum of the council and of the budget committee. And for the Board of Ed, Mr. Grippo? Here. Mr. Martelli? Here. Ms. Harrigan? M uh, Chairman Perugini? Uh, here. Ms. Ham? Here. Ms. Hallen? Here. And Mr. White? We have a quorum of the Board of Education as well. Great, thank you, Ms. Tablet. At this point, can we rise for the Pledge of Allegiance, please? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, the first item on our agenda is acceptance and appropriation of donations to the Human Services COVID-19 Assistance Program. And before I turn this over to our budget chair, Mr. Barry, to read the resolution, I, I wanna thank the public for being so generous to this account. As we all know, there are so many in need in our community at this uh, tough time with this pandemic. And uh, our human services department has been working tirelessly to assist those in need. And as always, this community has stepped up uh, tenfold to support those that need assistance. And this uh, resolution, is just further evidence of what this community always does to rise to the occasion to support each other. Uh, there are a plethora of very generous donations in this resolution. And I wanna thank on behalf of the town council, the board of ed and all of our staff, uh, thank you to everyone who was digging deep into their pocket in this tough time to support their neighbors and friends. Uh, so with that, Mr. Bari, I'd appreciate it if uh, you would read the resolution and take it from here. Yes, Mr. Chairman, thank you. It is an honor uh, uh, seeing this generosity to move the motion that uh, be resolved that the Town Council approves resolution 043020-1, be it resolved that the Town Council accepts and approves the following donations totaling $8,825 to the Human Services gift account for the COVID-19 assistance program, Kim Watroba, $600, Dr. Uh, Richard and uh, Elaine Lau, $200, Christopher and Pamela Rutka, $50. Kenneth and Elizabeth Allen, $100. Laurent and Michelle Madu, $1,000. Harold and Felix Jordan, $600. Arnett Talbot, $200. Michelle Piccarillo, $100. Anonymous, $50. Jeffrey and Yolanda Belmont, $300. Marsha Neustein, $25. John and Roseanne Hurdle, $500. Norman and Betsy Bond, $100. Cheshire Lights of Hope, $5,000. Wow. Do we have a, thank you. We have a, a, a second, Mr. Talbot. Uh, Mr. Bowery, anything you'd like to add? No, I think this goes along with what Michelle explained to us is the program that she's 
uh, uh, really reaching out to those in need of the community. And uh, there has been some good publicity about how we are trying to help out. And she's doing judicious use of the gift account, but also she's doing the other side. She's uh, uh, scouring the trees and, and uh, finding uh, ways to collect this money to get it to those that are in need. And so we, uh, we really are appreciative of that. Great, are there any questions or comments from members of the council regarding this resolution? Okay, seeing none with that, I will call for a vote to hopefully graciously accept these donations. All in favor? Aye. Aye. The motion passes unanimously and thank you again to all the individuals who donated. Uh, we really appreciate it. Uh, we're now on to item four, which is recap of pre previously discussed budget items. With that, I'll turn it over to you, uh, Chairman of our Budget Committee, Mr. Barwi, and I'm not sure uh, who you wanna lead with that. Right. Thank you, Mayor Orris. Um, I would ask uh, Sean if there are some updates. I know we had updates at the end of Tuesday night's meeting, so I'm not sure if there's anything uh, uh, to give, but we do this for follow-up. Yeah, and at this point, uh, nothing that I think we would be uh, leading with right now. I know we're going to have some discussions later in executive session, and we have some stuff we'll talk about then. But um, at this point, I don't have anything um, since our last meeting uh, a couple nights ago. Okay. All right, very good. So then we'll move right into the next, which is the proposed fiscal year 2021 operating budget, the annual capital budget, five-year capital expenditure, and tonight's devoted to education. And uh, it is our one uh, topic and one uh, subject uh, department that we're reviewing. We've reviewed others, and this is our sixth uh, meeting reviewing it, and we have two more next week. But this one is the largest expenditure of funds and uh, therefore uh, has the most time devoted to it. And I guess with that, I'd either turn it over to board chairman uh, Perugini for some opening comments or directly to superintendent Solon, whomever uh, would like to take the baton. Uh, I'll, I'll take it. I never get a chance to uh, acknowledge you guys. So, but uh, in, in all seriousness, thank you on behalf of the board of ed, superintendent Solon, Vince Massiana, and you know, all of us here tonight. We appreciate you guys uh, and girls having us tonight. Uh, we always look forward to having this conversation with you. As you know, it's a, uh, our budgets are always pretty uh, pretty intense, and this year is uh, prone to be a little bit more intense due to COVID. So, thank you for having us. Um, you know, we'll we'll try to address any questions you may have. But uh, I think Mr. Uh, Superintendent Solon does have a presentation to give, uh, and if you will allow, I think uh, we we'll let him have at it. All right, very good, Dr. Solon. Are you ready? Yes, sir. Thank yes, you very so. much, uh, Tony and. I just want to reiterate what uh, Mr. Perugini said that um, obviously, you know, it's a very much appreciated to be able to um, provide this presentation to you tonight. And obviously, you know, since this presentation or since the, the Board of Education adopted our budget, um, you know, back in January, the world has changed quite a bit. And so, you know, what you're going to see initially here this evening is indeed that budget that was adopted by the board back in January. And then I'm going to ask Mr. Massiana to share some uh, information around our capital budget presentation. Did you know this is the first year we're rolling our capital budget presentation into the uh, actual operating budget cycle? And then I will address some of the things that have uh, transpired since the onset of the coronavirus and how we've had to ad adopt uh, some certainly some changes and uh, that's led to some savings it's going to lead to some costs and how that all shakes out and feeds into next year's budget cycle so if you'd indulge me here a little bit i appreciate it um, i always have this slide in our presentations because Years ago, our community came together and the board adopted these two goals. We're at the corner of complex thinking and social emotional learning. That's critical to our kids and our community. Our community adopted these goals, created them, and that serves as the filter for everything we do in our school system. So what do we provide through our school budget? It's obviously the resources for instruction for all of our 4,285 students. But beyond that, it's the mental health, nutrition, medical care, uh, to all of those kids who access their instruction, the transportation, the specialized services, um, and the diverse opportunities for our students to engage in pursuits outside of the, cur the general curriculum. So music, theater, arts, um, athletics, all of those things are critical. We always say, you know, we don't create transcripts, 
we create uh, graduates, which are, are much different. So um, it's a big picture. And this is why we provide it. We're focused on the students in our school system and providing them every opportunity we can for success. So our initial internal budget request begins with our administrative team working with the teachers in their building and other staff to identify what are the needs that they feel would support their growth and, and evolution as a school system. We ask people to bring those needs forward. We uh, scrutinize those requests. We meet with the administrators uh, individually. We go through uh, this and uh, our initial budget request that was created internally was 7.6%. Um, and I think it's a, a little bit elevated really be in, in some respects because you know, when we look back on the last four years, that budget window, um, we have on an average over the four years uh, had a 1.47% budget increase. That's the lowest since 1976. And it, uh, I say that not knowing actually, I haven't been able to go back prior to 1976. So we're operating uh, fairly lean at this point. Some of the man management strategies within our budget, um, we've had a decline in enrollment. Uh, we also um, have kept line items uh, the same or lower than they were five years ago. We've engaged in more shared services with uh, groups like ACEs, uh, the Area Cooperative Educational Services. Um, for example, we have a shared transportation service for students with special needs who are going out of town. We will group students together on buses to those areas to save us significant money. And then obviously other efficiencies where we found ways to uh, enhance our services um, and reduce costs. Uh, one major one just recently was a um, uh, restructuring of our copier, our office copier uh, leases, and that was incredibly uh, successful and saved us a lot of money. Sometimes it's with the town, as was the case with our insurance. Uh, these are offset with some of the costs, you know, so uh, what I was just going through were things that had um, lowered our, our fiscal demand. Some of these other areas have increased our fiscal demand, um, such as our special education needs. That's a growing um, trend across the state of Connecticut. And we did shift to full day kindergarten several years ago. And I know we've talked a little bit about that in our facility needs. So um, ultimately I ended up reviewing that 7% budget in uh, presenting to the Board of Education a budget uh, increase of uh, just under $3 million or 4%. And ultimately after a lot of deliberation within the the board and the community. Um, and I appreciate all the time they spent listening to our staff and working through that process. We came to uh, an ultimate budget adoption on the board side of 2.93% increase over last year, roughly $2.1 million. So our recent, recent budget history recommendations, as you see, just kind of going through um, you know, years past, uh, kind of already touched upon that a little bit. This is our increase by budget element for the uh, 2021 year. So you'll see that of the uh, 2.1 million uh, increase that, uh, you know, roughly 73% of that is allocated to contractual increases, um, everything from our staffing increases and um, utility costs, transportation costs, 18% uh, goes toward restoration, predominantly in the area of our medical benefits plan, uh, where we're trying to close the gap between the annual claims that we receive and the amount of money that we, you know, that we fund into that account. Right now, uh, we're in a deficit mode there intentionally. We had a, a, um, a surplus in that account that over time we've been able to spend down uh, responsibly, but this um, hedges that a little bit. Um, and then the improvement piece uh, represents only 9% of the increase of, or about $200,000. So our budget highlights, you know, areas where we feel like, you know, we're, we're enhancing the services um, provided. And this is a little bit, um, you know, 
uh, this is an area where we we had really hoped to make some positive headway. Uh, we, in our budget, included two security monitor positions. Uh, as the council knows, we've been working through a process to develop person traps inside our schools. Um, the two that we've been focusing on for next year, just because of their uh, physical layout, are Norton Elementary and Chapman Elementary. Um, and we were hoping to build person traps there and hire folks to monitor those locations uh, when students arrive. A board certified behavior analyst, a BCBA, is somebody who is a, a state certified position that works with students with significant uh, developmental needs to support their growth and achievement. The math support position is a non-certified position at Dodd Middle School to provide uh, mathematic uh, coaching for students and remediation. We have that uh, sort of support at the elementary and high school, and we're ho hoping to fill the gap there. Uh, a full-time FTE is, um, the, for those of you who may not be familiar, is full-time equivalent. That's 2.5 positions. One at Darcy and other another one in a transition position, and then um, strategic planning. A decade ago, we identified a strategic plan as a school system, and uh, that plan is set to expire this year, this coming school year. And our goal is to uh, work with the community and all stakeholders to really uh, solidify our vision for uh, the school system moving forward and address any potential gaps between that goal and vision and um, you know wh where we want to be. So the restoration piece I already talked about being uh, a, an effort to kind of close that gap between the medical expenses and the funding as we move into the next school year. <laughs> so as I indicated before, the overall budget increase is uh, just over $2.1 million, uh, $2.1 or six, and the um, as you can see, kind of where those that money shakes out in our budget. Sixty-five percent of that is salaries and fifteen to benefits. So our organization uh, is very person-oriented. We believe that the best bang for our buck for our kids is with the people who work with them on a regular basis. Uh, the nine percent there includes transportation um, and additional support services, uh, instructional expenses. Um, those are things like textbooks and um, supplies, and then 5% into maintenance and operation in our, our facilities. So the items that have the greatest increase uh, in our budget this year are teacher salaries um, that for our 400 teachers, that pay raise would equate to just under a million dollars. Uh, the medical benefits uh, for all of our staff, I know that's a, a common issue everywhere that medical benefits are, are increasing. Instructional assistant salaries, the, the reason that that is uh, significantly higher is not necessarily due to uh, raises as much as it is the fact that we, uh, once the year started this year, had to hire additional instructional assistants to provide individualized supports for students who had those significant needs. Um, as I indicated before, special education can fluctuate uh, pretty greatly. And so when we hired those student or those instructional assistants on this year for students this year, we did need to carry them over into next year, which is why the, um, the more significant increase on that line item. Uh, tuition outplacements is also, you know, that's very expensive. I know that I've spoken to the board on many occasions and uh, to the council previously as well. But with new members, I would reiterate the fact that uh, in Cheshire, we work very hard to try and provide services in our local school system. Uh, we believe that not only is that better for students uh, from just a personal experience, but we can also do that um, at really a better quality in many cases and lower expense. So that's really our goal when we provide services uh, in uh, our school system, even for all students, whether it's students with special needs and um, 
or uh, accelerated students or you know any they have special needs too so our goal is to try our best to meet the needs of each individual within our school system sometimes that's not uh, necessarily in the in the student's best interest we don't have the capacity to meet this uh, an individual student's particular needs sometimes they're a bit unique in in respect to their needs and they need specialized services so we outplace those students um, and you know, there's a cost obviously associated with that. Our projected revenues for next year, I know this could be an area where people are, are wondering. Um, the state has reiterated on multiple occasions since the onset of, of the COVID-19 that uh, the funding in next year's budget is static. It will not change. And this is the revenue uh, that we calculate to the town based on those um, those figures and those statements on their projection, their biennial budget. So what if, you know, some of the things, that you, I know people ask, what's that gap between the, you know, 2.93 that was presented and the 7% the that, you know, we were looking at. These are some of the things that, you know, are requested and that we would like to move forward with but you know being financially uh sensitive we do um we did prioritize and identify those other areas that i've already presented to you <clears throat> so our projected enrollment for the 2021 school year uh you can see that uh, overall the um the enrollment is down by 47 students projected for next year um, we typically uh, have more students enrolled than the actual projection by a small amount. Um, so we're overall through the entire school system, the projection, as I said, was down by 47 students. Ironically, I received an email today from a family with two students moving into town next year. So it's always subject to change. So an excerpt from our NESDAQ report. Uh, the NESDAQ is the New England School Development uh, Council. They, they uh, provide enrollment projections for school systems throughout Connecticut, predominantly based on birth rates. They also evaluate the history of the community. And what they see for us is that um, they are expecting larger enrollments. Um, they're projecting that out so that in future years they are expecting our enrollment to increase and that's consistent with other uh, evaluations that we've had done. Oh. Heading south there we're in the other direction. So this is our class size um, and you can see on the top grid that illustrates our K through six enrollment uh, is a school system. You know, we have um, tried to retain, as I said before, our class sizes. We believe that that's an important priority for us within our, our financial constraints. Uh, if we're gonna uh, focus on something, it's gonna be social emotional learning, complex thinking. We think those are best addressed with smaller class sizes. So um, on the right-hand column, uh, on top right, you can see the enrollment by grade uh, throughout the school year. And then at, uh, at the bottom of that table, you can see the historical averages. Um, so our average K through six class size next year is 17.9, which is this year it's 18. It was 18.8 .8 the year prior, 17.9. So it's still, you know, kind of within that historical average for us. In the middle school grades, you can see the history uh, across the uh, projected class size next year. Seventh grade is 21.4. That's slightly lower than our historical average with grade eight, 24.1, um, about the higher end of our historical average. So the class sizes next year are slated to be roughly what they've been um, for the last several years. 
This gives you uh, just a different visual representation of that, that you can see kind of the, the history over time with our elementary K6 and 7-8 enrollment. Um, I'll give you a second to take that in. Our Cheshire High School enrollment, um, people ask about, you know, with the declining enrollment, where do we fall in terms of students per teacher? Um, we're at, of all the high schools in Dirt B, our district reference group, similar towns to Cheshire, we're um, second most students to teacher in that district reference group. Middle school, we're 26 out of 32 most students per teacher in uh, our reference group. So lower, lower third, lower quarter. Special education staffing. Um, as I indicated earlier, we had the number of IAs that had to be added during this school year uh, that need to be carried over into next year. That was that $125,000 increase in that line. Um, the I already talked about the Darcy and transition services as well as the, the 0.5 BCBA. So keep, keep moving along. The recommended net staffing changes, you kind of get a sense of um, this more holistically here. Apologize, give you a second again to take that in. So the with all of these changes, the net budget impact there is $185,000. And you can see the class sizes, you know, in each grade or each grade level down below. Our teacher staffing trend, again, talking about enrollment versus uh, staffing basically over the last seven years. Uh, every time we lose 30 students, we lose one certified teacher. And it's not as straightforward, obviously. We don't lose 30 students from one grade level in one building. That would be uh, pretty academic and easy to figure out. But when it's across 13 grades from K to 12, actually, you can say 14 grades because we also have extensive transition services. The, um, every time we do lose approximately 30 students, we lose a, a teacher. Our per pupil expenditure is an apples to apples account of how do school systems in Connecticut spend their budget. And um, it takes into account the operating budget for each school system divided by the number of students in the district. So you can see our um, history there on the left hand column of our per pupil expenditure. The last year that that was calculated was 1819. They usually release it for the uh, school year the following January. So um, the state average is $17,000. We rank 122 out of 166 school districts in Connecticut in terms of our per pupil spending. The district reference group B is usually the frame that we like to evaluate ourselves by. How are we doing? compared to other school systems that the state defines as similar to Cheshire. And so, um, you know, we look at the DERG B per pupil expenditure is 17,948 on average. So if we spent the average amount per student that our peers spend, our budget would be higher by $6 million annually. Um, so we rank 18th out of 21 DERG B community communities in terms of per pupil expenditure each year. So the return on investment, however, is really outstanding. Uh, if you look at our SAT score um, is a function of our per pupil expenditure, we rank 10th in Connecticut. Most of the schools that have a, a higher return on investment um, may spend less money and also receive lower test scores. If you look at our three through eight smarter balance assessment performance, where do we rank in the entire state of Connecticut? If you look at our math, our state math rank, which is 13, and our state ELA rank, which is nine, 
that's the fifth best average of all school systems in Connecticut, all K-12 school systems in Connecticut. So um, that is incredibly high achieving. Um, if you don't see that community above us and you think you know you hold that community in high regard, it means because they didn't perform as well as we have in three through eight um, smarter balance assessment uh, performance. Now I wanna tell you that this is not the only yardstick that is I, I think by any stretch, the way to judge a school system. It's not, it, it is a measure. Um, and it's the only measure I have that I know is apples to apples with what every other school system in Connecticut is doing. We do not aspire to rank high on this. It's nice, but we focus on social emotional learning and complex thinking and our kids can think uh, with depth and critical thinking, and so they happen to achieve. It's not, we're not drilling kids every week on how to do this smarter balance assessment better. So uh, that's why I'm, I'm especially proud of our students' performance in that area. Um, is further evidence of, of this, uh, our English language arts and math performance for special education um, in four years ago, was 24th in English language arts, now it's second. In math, it was 29th, and now it's second. So all of our students are benefiting from the focus on uh, complex thinking and social emotional learning. The overall state ranking for special education performance, uh, just like our general education performance, we rank fifth, uh, we're tied for fifth in Connecticut with our special education performance. So again, uh, something we're very proud of, we're not focusing on just supporting a certain group of students, but all students to find success. And I think this is evidence of that fact. Again, I, I started with indicating that, you know, we spend substantially less money than uh, similar communities, but we have, incredible results. And I think what, what I'm trying to illustrate is that we represent an excellent value for our community. Um, we have record high student achievement, uh, multiple elementary schools of our Connecticut schools of distinction, always uh, recognized as a top community for music in America. 93% uh, of our high school students participate in extracurriculars. As I said, the well-rounded student is something that we really emphasize. Uh, we've won the CIAC, Connecticut Interscholastic Athletic Conference, Michael's Cup, uh, six consecutive years. I don't know anybody else who's, who's done that. It's really quite impressive. And uh, we're the top best buddies chapter, which is a, an organization that supports, that, peer, that pairs up students uh, across the district with peers, uh, special needs students and uh, peers to engage in all sorts of social activities is really phenomenal. And that's why they were honored as the top chapter in Connecticut. And I want to reiterate something I've shared before, that investing in our schools is an investment in our community overall. Um, this is something I, I share pretty regularly. This is from, from Duke uh, about how, you know, investment in the school system, high-performing schools uh, have uh, higher, higher priced homes. The initial budget request, again, on Key takeaways over over 7%. We aggressively pared that down to 2.93%. Again, an outstanding value for our community. Uh, the addition of the certified position really is designed to support special education students, as well as the, the IAs that we hired impacting our budget. So um, just as I close here, I, I wanna really thank all of our students and our parents, our educators, our community. You know, in this PowerPoint presentation, I, I touched upon the incredible success that we've had. And that is an absolute product of the efforts of everybody that you see on the screen. And I can't tell you, you know, sure over the last four years, those folks have pulled together to, to lead to this success. But since we've gone to remote learning uh, seven weeks ago, I, I, I am so 
proud and inspired by the way that our kids and our parents and our community and you know, particularly our educators, as I see them up close and personal every day, dedicating themselves to continuing to make sure that our students' needs are addressed to the greatest extent possible in these unbelievable and unprecedented times. So I want to thank all of our parents, students, and, and community uh, with a special shout out with, with Tuesday being Teacher Appreciation Day to all those folks who work in our schools and really do dedicate their lives to our student success and, and to supporting each other to, to find that success. So thank you very much um, to our community. And I don't know if folks wanna break for any questions on that part, or if we wanna see Mr. Massiana's overview of, um, of our capital budget. That's only about four or five slides uh, before we get into the COVID response, but um, Mr. Barrow, we, uh, uh, well, we, since it's all interrelated, uh, why don't we just yeah. continue on if you don't mind okay. and not break the momentum? Great. So, um, Mr. Massian, I'll let you present. I'll just click the slides for you. I, I really appreciate that. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for the opportunity to present. Um, I, I do have just some very high level slides for um, this evening's presentation on the capital budget. And I wanted to start with what you see on the screen here, which is the capital budget approval request that was completed just this past August. So because we are transitioning from approving a capital budget every August to doing that as part of our operating budget, we really didn't have a full year um, of capital budget needs to plan for. So the important point that I wanna make is, you know, in August, the town council approved the Board of Ed's recommended capital budget request of $3,545,000. And you could see, you know, the categories that those approvals uh, were in. And we've already started working and planning for those improvements. Um, in addition to this $3.5 million that was approved, the town council also appropriated an additional $150,000 for a school modernization plan. And that work is underway. And I, I think that's an important uh, piece of information to have in the backdrop because the capital budget request that I'm gonna show you in a minute for this fiscal year that we're discussing is, is much smaller because of those two things, because we had a large capital budget approval uh, plus, we're working on a school modernization plan, so we don't want to overinvest in a particular building or a school until we have that plan completed. So, again, that school modernization um, plan, a committee has been set up. There's a meeting Monday night. We, we had a slight pause because of COVID-19, but we're resuming work on Monday. So, Jeff, if you go to the next slide, the... The request that has been made uh, that was approved by the Board of Education has been put forth now to the town council. So the funding request for the 2021 fiscal year is the $585,000 that you see in front of you. And I'll give you a little bit more detail in the next two slides, but if we look at it by the type of request, if you could just stay with that one, one second, thank you. The, $585,000 breaks down starting kind of at the top there. Interior building improvements are 50,000, about 9%. HVAC improvements are about 11%. And then the 470,000 is, it's basically roofing and some sidewalk improvements. So that's 80% of the 585,000. In the next slide, we'll see the same 585,000 broken out by the school that those funds would be allocated to. So you could see Dodd would have the largest portion and of that 270,000, 250,000 is, is for roof and parapet repairs. Um, and then district-wide projects is about 21%. And then the remainder are, you know, 8% 8, 8 you know, for each of those schools, Doolittle, Chapman, Cheshire High and Highland. Uh, in the next slide, I'm, I'm giving you a little bit more detail as to what each of the requests are. So starting from the top, the 270,000 requested for Dodd, 250,000 of that is for replacement of the roof sections 
or certain roof sections at Dodd. You know, Dodd's roof is past its warranty. We um, have been doing, you know, various repairs to the, the roof is, you know, leaking periodically, but we're doing repairs the, to avoid making a very large investment in Dodd. You know, as part of school modernization, we've been talking about, you know, potentially um, having a, a new middle school that's not been decided, but that's why we're trying to keep that roof system in, in repair without uh, investing roughly the, the two plus million dollars it would take to repair the entire roof system. The other $20,000 to make up the 270 for Dodd, I've, I've underlined there, it's a, it's a new request to do some initial design work to complete rooftop um, unit replacements totaling 400,000 in future years. And the reason I highlighted and italicized that is the, the request there is to set aside planning money so we can design the rooftop unit replacements to do the work in next year, assuming that those capital budget dollars that are requested for next year get approved. So this, the idea here is to have some projects that are um, shovel ready is a term that we've used. Um, the other thing, that I do want to point out, which I'm, I'm sure the town council and board of ed members are aware, but just to make everyone you know, in the community that's watching aware, we typically don't borrow funds for design work. That's usually coming out of capital non-recurring, our cash. So if a decision were made that we're really trying to conserve um, cash dollars and we didn't want to approve that portion of this capital budget request, that, that's a place that the, the council can look toward. Um, not that we don't wanna you know, have those projects ready to go, but that you know, is a decision that can be made. The next one is $125,000. That's requested to do sidewalk replacement. We would, as in the past, we would do sidewalk replacements on a worst first basis. So if this were to be approved, we would, um, rate all the sidewalks across the school uh, district and then determine which ones would be repaired first. Doolittle is $50,000. Um, that entire request is for design work. The Doolittle roof, which is not leaking, is uh, much past its uh, warrant, its 20 year uh, period, it's out of warranty. That would be roughly a $2 million roof replacement so the $50,000 would be to start planning for the replacement of that roof. Again, so that's planning money, design money that would come out of CNR. Uh, Chapman, the $50,000, as we were working through the person trap security solution uh, with our uh, fire marshal, it was determined that we would need an additional egress solution out of the school gym. So that was estimated at $50,000. And the next one, Cheshire High School, $45,000, again, planning money for unit ventilator and air conditioning phase in. And that is about $1.2 million requested for future years. And lastly, Highland, as we were replacing the uh, government freezer, the, it was realized that the roof system and the support for the roof system is starting to fail. So we would need $45,000 to um, you know, replace the roof and the roof deck. That totals 585,000. And then you'll see the bottom of the note there is 115,000 of the 585 is design work. And that rounds out at least a high level capital budget funding request. All right. Thank you, Mr. Bess. Yeah, I just want to make one comment because uh, you mentioned it and it's sort of uh, uh, germane actually at this point right now that the capital budget is presented for the first time with the operating budget this year, but because of the delay in actions, because of the COVID and because of the fact that we're spending considerably more time on the operating budget, we are getting the presentations from the departments as we're moving along, but it doesn't appear realistically that it's likely that we'll be adopting the capital budget at the same time at the end of May that we adopt the uh, operating budget. I would say it would probably be sooner 
soon after that, as opposed to waiting to August timeframe so that we're not doing it in the summer when people are away and the experts we need for help may not be available, nor the council members we need to get together. But realistically, it's probably going to be pushed off to action in June for the capital budget. The charter still requires we do it by the fall, so we're still within that. But uh, just thought it was an apropos time to, to mention the, the timing on that. Thank you. I'll let you continue on now. David, can I add uh, just one comment? Uh, I, don't know if, I don't know if Ben uh, mentioned this, but uh, one of the other reasons the capital budget list looks smaller to previous years, and quite frankly, it's the smallest I, I've seen proposed since I've been on the board, is there are, as you, as town council knows, under the five-year capital plan, there's many more projects that could be coming down the pike. But one of the things that Vincent uh, made us aware of early on in the process is that even if we wanted to do more project, I think we've reached our maximum uh, of what the PBC and board can actually do with capital projects because we have a number already in play. There's a number that just started for this year. And I think even if the town council is joining us to give us more money for capital budgets, I don't think we have the combined um, really resources to get it done. Vincent, correct if I'm wrong, but I know that we were pretty much, we had a lot of shovels in the ground, so to speak and uh, almost out of shovels. But uh, I don't know if you want to comment on that from off the mark, but no, it was back in January, so. You are right on the mark with that. And we, we're, we haven't completed, you know, very much of the 3.5 million that was approved in August. So there's, there's not, as you said, not much more capacity. The items that we did add to the capital budget were some of the things that came up between August and when we prepared the capital budget, which, you know, was February initially. So uh, not, nothing has changed since then. So I, we, I think the recommendation at the 585 makes sense. And I think that is the end of the capital budget presentation. Operating yeah. budget is done, so. Okay. Yeah. So I, I, I just wanted to move on and really kind of capture the coronavirus impact on us. Uh, and I presented most of this to our uh, finance committee on Monday night. And to say this is a fluid situation, you know, really from March 13th, the, the last day that we had our, you know, standard brick and mortar school day to now would be a, a dramatic understatement. You know, just today, uh, it was great news to hear uh, Governor Lamont suggest that on May 21st, we, we could plan on opening up more businesses. And I know that's welcome relief for a lot of folks, but uh, what you're gonna see here is our best judgment, our best uh, accounting of what the future may hold. And to give you some historical context here, you know, for centuries, school systems have been brick and mortar institutions that we relied on face-to-face -face instruction um, all of us are really familiar growing up in that institution. Since March 13th, the, the six to seven weeks we've been doing this thus far, you know, we've, we've really had to shift gears as a school system. We've had to provide adequate technology to hundreds of students, staff, um, including wireless hotspots to families who needed it, it uh, in order for students to be able to access school. That was a unique challenge that uh, we had never faced before. Devising instructional frameworks to adequately support remote learning um, is different. It's absolutely different when you know that the student's not gonna be in front of you. So uh, K2, it, it started with learning um, learning toolkits and then uh, three through six now we're, we're humming along with remote learning. Um, none of that is perfect by any stretch, um, but for the six weeks versus centuries, I'm really quite proud of the work our staff has done. And um, we think it's important to survey our, our students, our staff, and our parents. And the feedback thus far has been very positive. Um, and we're looking forward to, you know, kind of re-initiating uh, that same process again with more parent surveys next week. Um, we've had to provide a lot of professional development. This is very new. Um, for a lot of folks and how to prepare uh, remote learning information, how to access this and how to engage with your kids 
in a different format is definitely something that was new learning for a lot of our folks and it continues to be ongoing. Um, obviously navigating legal and privacy considerations in the process that was, you know, you read a lot of, of districts, you know, pulling off a of Zoom uh, because of some of the Zoom bombing and other issues, privacy concerns. Uh, we didn't leap into that. We, we certainly researched it and um, things have been running quite smoothly with our Google Meet platform. And not that it's foolproof, but uh, I think it was a prudent decision on our part. Um, and then obviously addressing morale. Um, this is a tough time for people on a lot of different levels, whether it be medically, financially, or just you know being home alone and dealing with that dynamic. And so many of the things that our kids have missed out on through this uh, period, it, it's really painful to think about. So that's some of the context that we're operating in today. I already touched about um, the Bergby per pupil expenditure, excuse me, in the last slide um, or in the last presentation. Uh, the future orientation uh, is really undetermined, to be honest. I mean, uh, right now, uh, it, the governor's last report, we return to school on May 21st. Um, you know, I, I don't know that that's likely to happen, but there's the possibility that exists. Uh, I was invited. I mentioned ACES, uh, the Area Cooperative Educational Services, as the suburban uh, superintendent representative on a committee that's looking at back to school and what that would look like for our kids and our communities across Connecticut. And so hopefully we'll have some insight on that process, but um, it's gonna look different even if we return in, in August. Uh, social distancing, and that has implications for class instruction and class uh, school functioning. Uh, the sanitation efforts are certainly going to, uh, there's the expectation that those will be enhanced, I'm sure, at the least. Um, instructional design to support assessment and remediation. Students uh, we're are going to come back to us in a lot of different places, having engaged in remote learning. I think as much as we've done a good job, it'll be important for us to evaluate the needs of our students when they return, whenever that may be, um, whether it's in August or could be potentially later, unfortunately, who knows. And then um, when we do evaluate those students delivering the supports that they need to, to continue to make gains. And then obviously, as I mentioned, the social emotional piece, there's a therapeutic compete, uh, component to all of this. Um, as we consider returning in August, um, you know, and then if we continue remote learning, there are other variables, transportation, uh, continued intervention, instructional design, et cetera. I, I can't possibly list them all on that slide. Uh, so the fiscal considerations, obviously I reviewed the 2.93% increase uh, that the board had adopted for our budget. We know that the projected town revenues have increased uh, slightly, which is great. Uh, always good to see our grand list growth. And then, you know, we were asked to consider what a flat mill rate would look like um, and how we would achieve that uh, you know, certainly an admirable um, goal and target that we want to shoot for. So we need to evaluate what would the um, what would that look like in terms of our budget implications. So earlier this year, anticipating um, some of this, the board had the wisdom to pass a policy that indicated that, uh, in in accordance with state law, that we could ask the town council to carry over up to 2% of our budget from this year to the following fiscal year. And I think if we're permitted to do so, that would really go far away in mitigating uh, that $1.8 million reduction. A $1.8 million reduction in an operating budget in any given year would be uh, really significant for us. Uh, I talked about already how lean we operate now. Um, the anticipated COVID savings. Now, you're going to see on a lot of these slides, they, they begin with terms like anticipated. As I mentioned before, this, is, um, this can fluctuate greatly. And these savings were calculated based upon a return to school date of June 1. So if indeed um, we are closed for the remainder of the year, the savings could be greater. If, if we happen to return on May 21st, then that would also impact it. Um, the savings negatively, of course. So substitute teachers, overtime, transportation, spring sports, trash utilities, 
total anticipated COVID savings, again, you know, anticipated is 656,477. Now, we're also anticipating costs um, that over the summer, we are anticipating in preparation for a return to school and supporting our students over that time, a cost of approximately $200,000, um, which would mean our net COVID savings are $456,000. I just also wanna take a second to address something about spring sports. I know that um, a number of high school parents were concerned about our high school spring sports coaches not being paid for the spring season. Um, we've had, had no contests or practices, but um, on March 13th, uh, excuse me, March 12th, when the union and I spoke about a memorandum of understanding, I have to give them a lot of credit. Um, it was something that wasn't popular amongst some other unions across the state, um, but our union said, no way, this is best for kids. We need to start doing remote learning as soon as we think it's appropriate. And they immediately signed a memorandum of understanding. And I, I know, um, because I, I was a signer on that, on March 12th, that at that time, nobody anticipated schools being closed for the remainder of the year. You know, it just, I don't think it was, it was in our, our worldview at that time that you could even conceive of that. Um, yet in that, um, in that document, one of the items that we addressed was closing uh, with, with COVID, we were gonna pay the winter uh, coaches because they had in essence completed the season. And we indicated in there and the, the agreement between myself and the union that we wouldn't be paying the spring coaches if they didn't coach this season. So there has been some confusion about, you know, that information getting to coaches. Um, and I met with them yesterday on a Zoom call. And I told them at that time, I will review this and get back to them this week. I have spoken to Mr. Perugini, or excuse me, next week. I've spoken to Mr. Perugini. I initiated a conversation with union leadership. This is bigger than me just saying, sure, pay the coaches. So I will evaluate what's best you know, for our school system with the union leadership and uh, others and make a determination moving forward about how do we uh, address this situation appropriately. Additional potential reductions uh, for the 1920 school year. So we talked about savings that would uh, be available through the uh, impact of facility closure. Um, we are still in school, as I'm, I'm sure you recognize uh, if you have students in, in particular at home, but uh, we are still in school, but our facilities are closed. There are certain savings there. And as such too, um, I went through with our administrative team and with, uh, you know, including Mr. Massiana and Ms. Solano or, or key to that, as well as, you know, special education and, and Tracy Hussey to try and identify where could we make significant reductions in our budget uh, for the remainder of this year with facilities being closed that we could carry over potentially to next year to mitigate the reduction in our, our budget for that year. So we looked at um, a security manager position we had budgeted. We've um, elected to defer that um, and not hire that position for the remainder of this year. Um, reduce instructional supplies, curriculum materials, library media supplies, uh, maintenance and repair accounts and the additional potential reduction savings that we identified was 491,283. And I can provide you some detailed view on how we came to these numbers. Um, let me enlarge that a bit for you. So, um, you know, teacher salaries, we had some uh, unanticipated retirements leading into this year. And so there is uh, money to be recouped through that account. Uh, substitutes, as I mentioned, you know, we're not in a position to, to need substitutes at the time. Uh, and I, I don't wanna 
bore you to death by going through this line item by line item, but uh, I think you can see and certainly, you know, ask, ask questions if something jumps out to you. But uh, with overtime being, you know, reduced and, and eliminated really for the most part, um, that has uh, created savings, um, no substitute nurses, a lot of our instructional assistants and nursing staff have been playing a pivotal role in our lunch distribution. So I just want to take a, now, a moment to acknowledge the IAs who stepped up in the lunch, uh, excuse me, the, the nursing staff who stepped up to, you know, uh, engage with the community at a time when that can be scary. And, um, you know, with foregoing their own health, I mean, but they, they are wearing personal protective equipment. But nevertheless, they're out there doing this work. And I would certainly be remiss if I didn't mention that tomorrow is Lunch Lady Appreciation Day. So um, an incredible shout out to Madeline Diker, our entire food services team, who have been doing an amazing job with food distribution to the community. I'm sure that you know, you've seen and heard that in action. And um, we're incredibly proud of the work they've been doing. Um, our medical benefits is actually higher. That's been a, a bit of a cost um, as some employee spouses have uh, lost their positions and um, the, the employee had to roll over onto our insurance uh, benefits as well as our unemployment compensation has uh, gone up as we, um, we do pay unemployment benefits through the state for um, particularly substance. So more detail there, you know, with the reductions that we've attempted to create in this budget in order to, as I said, mitigate the impact on the budget for next year. As you can see, the total budget in the bottom right hand corner on this slide, the, the savings between COVID and additional spending adjustments gets us to one Point one million, one million one hundred forty-seven thousand seven sixty-one. Now, um, please remember that I did indicate we anticipate approximately two hundred thousand dollars in in COVID preparation costs over the summer. So that number, uh, unfortunately, can be adjusted uh, downward. So uh, this kind of gives you a sense of by budget category where those reductions are being made, um, either through COVID or additional spending adjustments. This slide uh, illustrates some of the same information, but in a more comprehensive manner because it includes um, visually here that the COVID impact costs plus the CARES Act money. Now the federal government has released um, money for school systems to the state of Connecticut. Uh, and the way that they've decided to distribute that fund, those funds to school systems is through what's called the Title I grant. And um, we receive a Title I grant on an annual basis of about $112,000. The state has said you can anticipate receiving approximately 83% of that. Um, when we multiply it out, this is the number. So all in all, from this school year, the 1920 school year, we're anticipating of that 1.8 million that we were hoping to recoup for next year, $1 million approximately, just over $1 million. So um, of course, you know, any reduction we make comes at a sacrifice uh, to programming or services, um, but it reflects the current circumstances. And what I'm going to show you on the next slide is really that $800,000 that what I'm showing you is in excess of $800,000 actually, but it will give you a sense of where our reductions are given the, the lean operating budget that we have. Um, it, there aren't a lot of what people would, might consider to be quote like fluff items. Um, the items that have the lowest impact on students uh, most immediately are in that kind of orange color. 
and you'll see like budgeting three additional retirements into our um, into our budget. It's a calculated risk, but I think that three is is fair. We identified three teacher retirements in our uh, first budget uh, go through uh, to get to that 2.93. This um, this counts on three more. As of today, I have four. So, um, you know, like I said, it's a calculated risk, but uh, we think we'll probably get there. The school security manager position next year, um, foregoing that again. The hall monitor positions, you know, again, I hate to, to do that um, because it does, uh, it addresses a security concern that we have, but they're not teaching students. Um, so that's, that's an area that, that we're considering. None of these things is set in stone. This is something that, you know, as a board of education in a community, we will have to work through identifying, you know, what areas would need to be reduced. Communications uh, is an area we've, we've cut back on, but um, as our uh, new website comes online, we're thinking that perhaps $10,000 there uh, could be a place that we could reduce. There's nothing on this list that anybody looks at and feels good about, obviously. These are all impact um, positions. You've got several teachers on this um, page. Just to clarify, the class size increases half team. That, that's um, Dodd Middle School. I apologize for not being clear on that. That's, uh, that's Dodd, so that's two teaching positions there. One at the elementary, one at the high school, um, one special education position. So several teaching positions, the world language at the elementary level is another teaching position. So there are um, significant impact here at a time when we're trying to maintain social distancing. So obviously none of this is, is good stuff. So the impact summary, the title of all reductions in revenue increases, this does not include any revenue increases such as things like uh, parking or, or sports or um, building use fees or anything like that. Um, the total is $1,047,000, one sixty-six from the prior, or from this year. So from the, the, the next school year, that's the total. As I said, it exceeds 800,000. And somewhere in there would be the menu to how do we address this, um, these savings. Uh, I've already showed the students per teacher rank. This is all of DIRGB, all students, all levels for general education teachers, uh, second to the most students per teacher. I've showed the elementary class size changes um, in the first presentation. So I guess that takes us to a point where we're ready to address um, questions and, and discussion. All right. Thank you, Superintendent. That's a lot of information. I. Uh, uh, to digest, and I know there's going to be a lot of questions of council members. Uh, but uh, procedurally, what I'd like to do is, I, there may be a couple of other board members, the chairman or others may have a couple of comments uh, quickly for the to round out the presentation. Then I'd like to open it to council members for questions. And uh, uh, after that, following that, I think what we will have is. Uh, uh, Ms. Talbot will give us the list of comments and uh, that we've received. We've all received quite a few in the email, and I know some she hasn't probably even had a chance to send out yet because uh, they've been coming in fast and furious. So uh, we will hear from those. So uh, with that, uh, Chairman Perugini or other Board of Ed members want to have other questions or comments? Um, uh, David, thank you. No, I keep really short because that is a lot of information. I, I know Tim and, and maybe Adam might also chime in. So. Uh, there's, we went through a long budget process, as I'm sure most town council folks know. Uh, we had about six to eight meetings in January, uh, went through a lot of detail. And what's worth noting is that the board uh, did reduce the superintendent's proposal, I think by about eight or just under $900,000 without, without putting any of the line items in a negative territory. In other words, all the line items you saw, whether it's maintenance or um, uh, textbook supply still increased over last year. And uh, we did also look at the medical trust fund and we felt at the time in January that, you know, that was a very hefty balance and that it could, you know, if need be, be reduced slightly. 
So, you know, it's, uh, so going through this latest list, you know, based on a potential um, no increase to, to the mill rate next year, trying to keep things flat, you know, this is, this is where we landed. Um, again, these are just talking points, ideas of where we would go. Uh, again, none is set in stone. We're not sure what's going to happen. I'm, you know, I'm sure the town, town as well with the economy, but I think we, we all, I can speak for the board that we're all pretty much uh, very concerned about what's coming from an economic point of view. Um, and just the one thing I want to uh, leave you folks with is, you know, we're certainly here to help. Uh, we we'll try to give you the impact of any changes. I think you saw most of it, but I think, um, you know, for, from my point of view, and I think most board members might share this, we're looking at this not just as the immediate 12 months. Um, you know, the, the COVID savings or surplus, I should say, that uh, both Jeff and Vince identified as a one-time event. Uh, a year from now, um, you know, if the economy doesn't turn around and we have budgetary problems from the state, we're not going to have that $600,000 uh, available to us. So for me, um, while I don't like some of the things that we had to look at, uh, you know, if, if we have to initiate those, we'll do what we have to do. But my greater concern is looking out two years and possibly three. We may not be able to talk about that tonight, but uh, do know we'll, we'll look as much as we can. But that being said, uh, thank you, Jeff, for your presentation. I, Dave, I think Tim had his hand up earlier. Okay. Uh, Mr. White, you had a question or comment to the presentation? Yeah, thank you, Dave. Yeah, uh, Jeff, two, two questions. I'll try to be brief. If you can't be, then we can talk about it later. But um, in terms of enrollment you had mentioned, uh, from what I recall, uh, 10 or 12 years ago, with the bailout, all that stuff, and the economy kind of tanked, you had enrollment go up. Do you have any idea what it what it went up like was it i mean a couple students or like 100 200 students tony do you happen to remember what happened from, from 12 years ago yeah um i don't know that number off the top of my head but it is in our budget book or for people at home it's on our our history of enrollment is located on the cheshire public schools website under board of education uh, budget stuff okay yeah, yeah just we, again unemployment sorry. goes down and yeah, we, it was, yeah, 2010 or 11, actually, I think what had happened was there was, uh, because the economy hit pretty hard, we, we did see at the high school level in particular, an increase in enrollment due to some families, you know, either permanently or temporarily moving their kids out of private school and bringing them to high school. But I don't know that number, there, there was a bump, but. Uh, okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, and the second thing, I don't know if you want to speak to this, Jeff, explicitly, but. Uh, I think your slide on possible recommended budget reductions included 80,000 in CHS course offerings. Is that is that supplies? Is it teachers? That's a position. A position. Okay. Yeah, that's a that's one teaching position. Okay. All right. Thank you. Dave. Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, I'm assuming that was Mr. Oris. Yes. <laughs> okay, Mr. Oris. Thank you, Mr. Barwe. I just wanted to jump in the beginning, if you don't mind, just to kind of uh, kind of frame kind of the town council thought process for the members of the public that may be watching that haven't caught some of the prior budget meetings. Uh, as we all know, because of this pandemic, we are dealing with uh, things happening in our community and our economy like we haven't seen in 100 years or more. Uh, residents and businesses are being decimated and we don't know how long that's going to continue. Um, and as a result of that, none of us really know how bad that impact will be relative to our decisions on our budgetary um, uh, items that we're dealing with. So the town council is really trying to balance with our total budget here uh, the needs of everybody, our school system, our services we provide to the town and the financial needs of our community. And so that in this environment is a very difficult task. Uh, I know there is some consternation from many, including a lot on the Board of Ed side, that the council is asking for you to look back and see what kind of cuts we can come up with uh, to try to generate a budget that we think fits the situation that we're in and balances the, the risks and rewards that we have to. Um, you know, we. It's not an easy task, folks. People are being decimated. And I, I unfortunately can't look our taxpayers and our businesses in the eye and, and, and tell them in light of what they're suffering that, that we're going to have big budget increases. 
Uh, it's just not something I can get behind. So what we've asked for is let's take a look at what a zero mill rate increase would look like. And we've asked all the departments, uh, town side, board of ed side, to, to let's see what that looks like. Um, none of us want to gut services. Uh, we all know that. This, this community assumes we're going to provide certain basic services, and, and I'm hoping that we're going to continue to be able to do that. Uh, but we have to try to do some hard work. And I'm convinced that we're not going to get there uh, without having labor to the table. And we can talk about cuts in various line items, but the bulk of our budgets on both sides of the street is labor. And what's important for the community to understand is the budget presentations that you've seen so far assumes standard increases in wages to all of our employees, whether they are contractual obligations or not. Uh, I believe that's a tough ask in this environment. When so many uh, residents and businesses are being decimated, people are working for less money. People on the front lines in the hospitals are working for 10 and 20% less dollars because the hospitals are being decimated. I think it's difficult for us, unfortunately, as hard as this sounds, to believe that we should be providing uh, wage increases to anyone. What I'm trying to do with my vote as a council member is to keep the status quo. Let's keep people employed. Let's keep them all the benefits they've got. Let's continue to do what we do today for the foreseeable future so that we can get through this together. If we don't stand shoulder to shoulder together as a group on all sides of the street and figure out a way how we can all do our part to get through this, we are gonna unfortunately have to consider some deep cuts which are gonna be devastating. However, if we all do our part, little bit each, I think we can get there and nobody can suffer greatly. So the council is generating a tough task right now, unfortunately because of the times. And I just wanna frame it that this isn't easy folks. Uh, I wish we weren't having these tough conversations, but we all know what we're dealing with and we don't know how long that's gonna, it's gonna continue. This may crop up again in the fall, uh, businesses may be shuttered continually after that again, so we just don't know what we're dealing with. So I, I just want to kind of give you a little thought as to what we're thinking, at least I'm thinking, I don't want to speak for the rest of the council, but I am really hoping we can have a zero mill rate increase. Uh, and I'm hoping that we can get a, a, a meaningful dialogue with all of our employees um, about going forward without increases uh, for at least the next 12 months uh, so that we can minimize the impacts to services, et cetera and all get through this together with not a lot of impacts. And, and that hasn't been presented yet in any of these presentations because we're assuming everyone's getting a raise. I think the teacher's contract is 2.7% in the contract that we have. And I don't begrudge anyone for the contracts that we have, but these are unprecedented times. And as you said, Superintendent Solon, we are in unbelievable and unprecedented times. Uh, I agree with you. And because of that, we're having these tough conversations. So. I'll leave it at that and, uh, you know, certainly turn it over to anyone else for questions. We're probably going to get into the weeds in a bit, uh, but I just wanted the public to understand at least where my thinking is on this. So thank you. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you. And I, I also would echo some of what you were saying that uh, I think this has to be everybody working together. Uh, collaboratively is the only way we're going to go forward. And uh, I, I would venture a guess that if we were to have a zero mil increase, which is what we're sort of targeting because we haven't formally voted on that, but we've been targeting that by asking all the different departments. I would venture to say that if we had a zero mil increase, the Board of Ed would receive an increase. They're not going to be cut from last year's number. I'm hearing out in the community, oh, well, you know, they're, they're going to get less money. No, no scenario talks about the Board of Ed getting less money than they had last year. They will very likely not be able to get as much money as was asked for, and that's not unreasonable considering what has happened and transpired since January when they adopted their budget. I venture a guess that all the departments would not be submitting the same uh, budgets today that they submitted back before all of this happened with the COVID and the shutdowns and the uh, uh, businesses and all that. Uh, I would also mention that just in the last three weeks, over 1,000 people representing over 10% of the homes in Cheshire, just in Cheshire alone, have applied for unemployment. So uh, there are numbers that are uh, that we really need to be conscious of when we're looking at uh, what we're going to uh, be able to approve for a spending plan. But uh, going forward, uh, no budget scenario that the council has talked about yet in our budget workshop has not talked about the ability to have an increase in spending. It's just how much and where it's going to be able to be. And uh, we've got to be very careful about that. And if labor is 
is you know 65 percent of our budget on the school board and significantly uh, a portion of our budget on the general town government side as well that does have to be a part of this mix and hopefully it's a shared uh, uh, experience rather than uh, uh, just picking one or two or, or areas to because nobody wants to decimate any of the services we really want to hold and you know we talk about rainy day funds and things like that this is about as rainy as it gets i mean this is a 100 year event last time was 102 years ago something of this significance happened and so we're going through something none of us have ever lived through but at the same time we we the residents do have a level of services as, as mayor orsh just said that they expect us to be able to uh, uh fulfill and i believe that we are going to be able to put something together that will have the vast majority of the uh services that the residents expect at as reasonable cost, as close to a zero mill rate increase as we can get. And I think with that, I have to say, uh, uh, Superintendent and, and uh, Chairman Perugini and the rest of the board, I was impressed with uh, a lot of the achievements. Uh, uh, they, they show clear dedication on the part of uh, the excellent staff that you've got and uh, uh, a very involved parents in our community and support of our community overall has allowed the test scores to be terrific, maybe not commensurate with the level of spending, but that's the outcome result we want is not just test scores, but the whole child and uh, uh, the graduation rates and, and that they're moving on to live productive lives, which is our responsibility as those that provide the education to them and the support for the education. Um, with that, I think I- I wanna say other... thank you there, Mr. Barrowley. That's, uh... Very much appreciated. Our, our performance is certainly exceeding the level of spending. So I appreciate you know, that acknowledgement of all of our students and staff. Thank you. Thank you, Superintendent. I think I saw Mr. Grippo's hand and then I was gonna ask it, open it up to council for council to have questions and, and dialogue if we could. Um, but I don't see his picture right now. So I don't know if he's still interested, I lost it. No, no I'm here, I'm here. Okay. <laughs> um, Sorry, so many you. screens to slide through. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Bari. Uh, I just wanted to uh, first uh, echo uh, Chairman Perugini and uh, Chairman Orris's comments um, that the uh, the out years, uh, I guess the years two and three uh, of of the budget, not not including next year, which would be I think it's uh, 2021, where we have carryover costs, uh, are of great concern to the board uh, and consideration of uh, how we're going to move forward. Um, I'd also like to point out that um, the finance committee uh, reviewed um, uh, Mr. Solon's uh, and Mr. Uh, Massiana's uh, revisions um, on Monday. Uh, we spent over about an hour, 15 minutes, hour and a half uh, reviewing those, and that's online uh, on our YouTube channel. So if you want to get the in more in depth on uh, the thoughts of uh, the finance committee uh, on, on what we did there, uh, please uh, feel free to review that. Um, and, uh, and I just want to say that, uh, you know, I'll, I'll speak for myself that, uh, uh, that we're, that I'm committed, uh, to maintaining the, uh, the, uh, classroom ratios that we have. Uh, but I also, uh, think that in these times, uh, as you said, uh, Mr. Barry, uh, we're in the middle of a 100 year event and that, uh, there may, may need to be a shared sacrifice involved. Uh, but I guess we'll have to cross that bridge when we get to it. So, uh, thank you for the comments. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Finance Chairman. All right, are there council members with questions and dialogue sort of getting to the nuts and bolts and of this? <laughs> it's a lot to take in, huh? You need a moment or two more. Actually, uh, Peter. Uh, no, Mr. Talbot, I see, Councilman Talbot. Thank you, Mr. Barwi. Um, if nobody else was gonna raise, I certainly am happy to. So. Uh, Mr. Shulman, thank you for your uh, your presentation. And um, before I ask you to gaze into your crystal ball, um, your your COVID savings piece um, addressed the savings um, through June first. I've I assume that you made some comment about projecting those through the end of the year, and then taking it one step further for the for the 2021 fiscal year. What do you usually budget as far as summer school goes? And do you anticipate that that is even a possibility at this point? Yeah, that's that's a good question, Peter. And I I do have my favorite soothsayer, Mr. Massiana on the line. Um, but I, I do know, you know, first and foremost, if we don't return to school, 
um, at all than we anticipate uh, for this school year in the neighborhood of about $50,000 in additional savings beyond what I stated. In the summer school program, we really have two programs that, that run concurrently. One is uh, based in electives uh, that students you know, get to engage in enrichment activities, arts and crafts and science projects and things like that. Those are run on a, on a, a fee basis where we make sure that there's enough enrollment to cover the, the course. And it's a little bit like our adult education program in that way. So that whole element um, isn't really budgeted much in the way of, of money because it's, it's really publicly funded by those who participate as a user fee. Then you have a special education program there. And as much as, um, you know, you may think that there could be savings about available there. Um, we are still very early in evaluating that. Um, and part of that $200,000 summer uh, COVID response has to do with enhanced special education services um, for students who, you know, would otherwise get extended year services. What's that going to look like? We want to try and prepare for that. So I'd be really skittish about saying that there's any potential savings there. Uh, as a matter of fact, I, I'm hedging in the other direction. And then uh, if you if you want to throw this one to Mr. Massiana, then the uh, the the crystal ball portion. What you know? What are you hearing from your your counterparts and colleagues, and from the State Department of Education as to you know what what happens come come the fall? Um, you know, if you were, uh, if you were to put odds on it, what's the likelihood of returning August 28th even? Yeah, I'll let you take that one, Vinny. <laughs> <laughs> no, I forgot my crystal ball at home. If you give me an hour, I'll come back. But, um, okay. I, I do want to go back to, to address a little bit more detail. The the savings that we would expect if we went past the June 1st. So there's 13 more days of, of school that would be built in. Um, and the savings there, I, I did a little bit more refinement. You know, the, the bus contract, you know, we have not signed an agreement with the bus contractor DATCO yet, but what they've positioned that, you know, where they are now, you know, subject to us finalizing that, that would represent another 52,000 in savings from that alone. I would anticipate additional savings by not having any additional hours for our staff. So the savings is probably more in the $75,000 range um, if we go past the June one in the COVID savings. So that would certainly help us if that happened from at least from a savings perspective. Um, in terms of what, you know, what's happening in the fall, I don't think anybody, there's no clarity. Uh, Superintendent Solon is serving on a panel with ACES to start planning for those options. Uh, and actually my internal staff and, and my staff are all the operations staff. So technology, facilities, uh, transportation, uh, food service staff, we, we actually are having a brainstorming session next week to start to talk about, well, what, is, what are the different possibilities and what would that look like from an operational point of view? Possibilities could be, A, we don't come back and we're still in remote learning mode. B, we come back on a basis where you don't have all the students in the building at the same time. So you can have students in on alternating days. Um, you could have students in AM, PM, and, Again, this is all conjecture, so I don't want anyone to react that's watching. These are all ideas. If anything, we have some states and some countries that are a little bit ahead of us, so that's part of what we'll look at to make some initial plans. You know, if we do come back in August, I think we're going to probably, you know, have to wear, you know, personal protection. You know, so I do envision that there'll be masks and those types of things. So, 
you know, the, the sh I guess the short answer, Peter, is we don't know yet. You know, we're starting to think about and, and make some plans, but we're just trying to get through, you know, May at this point. Um, but we are already looking with an eye towards, you know, what does it look like when we come back? And then, you know, there might be cost implications associated with that, pluses or minuses. You know, if we did have to run two tiers of buses during a, a day, you know, that would add to our cost. If we're in remote learning, well, we're not running buses and, you know, we are under an executive order now to pay our bus contract or some portion of their contract, but that doesn't carry into next year. So, boy, there's a lot of unknowns and, you know, we'll do our best to navigate through, but um, step at a time, I suppose. And Mr. Barrowley, if I may uh, continue with one more before I turn it over to my colleagues. Um, it, it, it centers around, and I've been asking this of all the department heads, so I'll, I'll ask of the, uh, of the education department. And that is, you know, it, there has to be some silver lining to all of this. Um, and the fact that we had to go through it, are there lessons learned that that can help us when we come out on the other side of this. So, um, you know, is there the potential for savings, potential to do, uh, to do education differently once we get back to whatever normal will look like? And um, I guess as part of that is, um, you know, are we ever gonna see snow days again or will they become remote learning days? So when the BOE sets a, a calendar that says graduation is on June 18th, is that a date that's set in stone that, you know, automatically graduation will be June 18th because snow days will become remote learning dates? Yeah, there's the potential exists there to, to start with the tail end of your question that that could happen. Um, interestingly, as part of the memorandum of understanding, that we signed with the teachers that this wouldn't be precedent setting for snow days. I think, you know, at, at that point, neither party wanted to initially say, yeah, this is the new normal from now on. Um, as I said, we're, we're seven weeks into this great experiment, if you will. And um, yes, uh, to answer the, the, the initial part of your question there, we've learned a lot from this, an incredible amount. And I, that's why I, I kind of gushed over the, the work of our parents, our students, and our teachers, that we've all learned a lot about this. Some of it's been painful, um, but a lot of it's been uh, really insightful and eye-opening. And uh, there are some students who are really thriving in this environment, uh, almost preferential, and others who would throw their computer out the window tomorrow and um, are just dying to run back to school. And that probably staff and students alike and and parents too, God knows. So, you know, yeah, absolutely. We've learned a great deal from this. And um, I don't think to, to you know, kind of harken back to what Vinny said earlier, um, we've been so hyper-focused on getting through day by day that we're not ready necessarily yet to process that. Uh, we're not in a great place to reflect yet. We're, we're so focused on just making sure the next couple of weeks go um, well for our kids. And then we'll, we'll think a lot more about how do we, how do we leverage what we've gained from the experience? Thank you. And thank you, Mr. Bowery. All right. Thank you, Councilman Talbot. Um, related to what, uh, just if I could add on to that, related to what Councilman Talbot was talking about, and that is an update of savings and expenditures. Uh, it, it's taking COVID aside for a minute, every year when it's four months after the budget is adopted, there are always going to be some changes. There's going to be updates to the medical potential expenses. There's going to be updates to uh, uh, utilities expenses. There's going to be updates to teacher retirements and all that. What other numbers can be updated uh, either now, or, and, and some of them may have been included in your Monday memo, which you went over today, or uh, within the next 30 days, because 30 days from today, we are under order to have this budget done. Uh, we were only given yeah. an extra 30 days. Yeah, Ben, you want to take that one? Sure. So the, the starting point for the analysis that Jeff shared that the, the numbers and the savings numbers that were presented earlier were taking our actual expenditures through March 31st and projecting from that. 
Um, and what I explained to the finance committee and, and those that were in attendance at our meeting on Monday is that today's April 30th. So we'll get an update as of April 30th. And that's important because if you kind of remember back and it feels like centuries ago, but March, we were in school and on regular payroll through March 13th. It was March um, 17th, 16th was the first day we went you know, to this remote mode uh, and began remote learning on, on the 18th. So April will be the first full month of this two payrolls in April where we could start to understand what that trend is. So that'll enable us to better project payroll for the remaining uh, for the remainder of the fiscal year. So my point is but we'll have a better starting point next week because I'll have an update through April and then we'll start, and we've already started looking at any open purchase requisitions. You know, that that's a big process. We have, you know, just to give you a sense, we have about 3000 purchase orders we issue per year. So each of the uh, department managers, the principals need to go through their open purchase requisitions we'll start to you know, look at which ones we can close, which ones we need to add to. So I will have a better estimate in the next two weeks, you know, after we get April 30th and some time to work through those numbers. Um, and you know, some will go up, some will go down, but I'm pretty confident what we presented tonight as, as COVID savings and potential potential additional savings are sound and hopefully they'll get better. But you should also but have I, a, I, a decision was, about whether or not we're staying out of facilities. Correct. Um, you know, in the next two weeks. But that's for the current year. I, I'm, I'm talking about maybe some updates you want to make towards your projected uh, budget for next year, because this is about the time the board would be, would have the budget from the council and then would start making adjustments uh, at, as needed from the amount of money that was allocated. And, and there's always some adjustments. Yeah. And I, I know we're still talking about this year's budget because it's so unusual to even try to get through this. Every day is about a week or two, it seems like. But I'm talking about for next year, for the projection. It is the $75.5 million that we requested. Are there things in there that, that can change? And are there refined numbers that could help us? And historically, there have been. Something like that. I mean, on that one, I mean, I gone through this process a number of years, but I know Jane David. Usually, uh, you know, we're working with a number, and then we either back into areas that we need to reduce, and sometimes we get a better update around uh, actually May, I think, June, if there's any change in retirement. So, I, beyond those couple of sales, those are already accounted for in that list that uh, Jeff shared with you, you know, three additional retirements, plus all those other line items. Um, I, I I'm curious to see what comes out of the April analysis that, that Vincent does if the, the trend changes. Mm -hmm. uh, as far as going into next year, I, I think we've put on the table those things that could change, you know, negatively if we need a budget. Beyond that, I don't, I, I mean, besides the additional retirements, I can't imagine what else will come between now and June. You know, hopefully something positive, but okay. probably be the first Yeah, one. hopefully. All right, uh, thank you. I saw Councilman Jenks' hand. Is uh, flipping yeah, through so many screens there, Jim? Oh, there you go. Yeah, but, thanks, Dave. I was trying to find my, my mute button. Sorry about that. Okay. <laughs> uh, first of all, to, to Jeff, just want to say, and then to um, the speed with which you guys went to um, the distance learning or um, you know, learning at home was pretty, pretty amazing. I, I know there are um, and friends of mine and, and coworkers that had their school districts that were, you know, still not really doing anything for a couple weeks after we had, had, had started the distance learning. So it was uh, pretty great to see how fast you guys really uh, turned that on. So um, congratulations on that. Um, you mentioned uh, some students were doing well with this situation at home. I can tell you there are probably not too many parents that are doing well with this situation at home. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but we're, we're getting through it. Um, I just kind of wanted to clarify. So, in, if if we're if we don't get the the labor concessions on the on the salary side from the schools, 
are you saying, are we saying that everything that was in that list of the sort of high impact, medium impact, low impact, those items, are you saying that those items are going, are going to be eliminated? Is that the way we should be looking at this? I would say that, you know, if we, first of all, it's, it's predicated on our capacity to roll over that 2%. That's first and foremost, if we did not do that, and still tried to get down to a mill rate uh, that was equal to this year, you could, in effect, double everything on that list. Um, it would be decimating. If we do carry over and there aren't concessions, then yes, you know, we would have to take a real hard look at everything on that list in order to get down. There, There's just not other places to, to go. There's not you know, a lot of space in our budget that doesn't impact classrooms um, because that's where we emphasize our, our spending. Right. Is there, um, I noticed transportation was, I think the third largest wedge of your kind of on that pie chart you showed. Um, I mean, obviously assuming if we're not in school that there'd be some significant savings, but even if we are and how often do we look at how we can possibly have some savings in transportation or is that all just salaries and kind of um, fuel is that all sort of fixed costs and you want to take that yes so uh, the, well transportation is uh, basically a vendor contract with DACO so what we are always looking at is where can we consolidate our routes and and this has been a, a multi-year approach we as we've consolidated bus stops as enrollment changes, you know, we have been able to eliminate bus routes over the years. Um, so that's ongoing, you know, some of the other things that we do, because we do have to provide a seat for every student on the bus. When we plan our routes, if students over the course of the year are not um, actually showing up at the bus stop, you know, our transportation department places a call, you know, to that family's home to try and get that stop eliminated. Uh, any student at the high school that receives a parking space, we basically ask them to sign a, a waiver so that we don't need to add that stop. And we commit to parents that if they need to add the stop, we'll add it back within 24 hours. So we're always looking at how we can get the vendor cost down and it comes down to the bus routes. One of the things that's happened you know, in recent years in line with what uh, Dr. Solon explained is the cost of special ed has been increasing. The population of students, even though enrollment's going down, overall, the population of special ed students and the students that need specialized transportation offsets some of the savings that we've had because those costs have increased. So um, yeah, that's an important point. You know, that is our largest, you know, single contract with any vendor is the transportation contract. You know, we did enter into a new agreement with DACO this year. Uh, I believe it was before you were on um, the town council, Mr. Jinx. But this year's uh, new contract, we're in the first year, there was a zero percentage increase from the prior year. And what's built into the budget for 2021 is the 2% increase that um, we agreed to as part of the five-year contract. So I hope that answers um, the question. Yeah, it sounds like there isn't really any savings in transportation. <laughs> Tough we're to always on, We're always on that one. Yeah, okay, thanks. You're welcome. Uh, with regard to the uh, uh, comment that Councilman Jenks brought up and that the answer necessitated discussion about the 2% carryover, uh, both from the superintendent and the uh, uh, Mr. Massiana. Um, I, I do believe that that's something that the council will be considering. Uh, and I would imagine shortly, and I, we can ask the mayor if he can put that on an agenda soon, because I think that is an important piece to this whole puzzle that gets put together. And I haven't heard any opposition to it but we haven't discussed it as a budget committee or a council yet, but I, I don't see where there would be opposition to it. And I think uh, we would need to just have this on a, a upcoming uh, council agenda for the council to consider giving the authorization for that. Are there other 
Oh, uh, Councilman Walsh. Thank you, Mr. Brower. Um, thank you, Superintendent Solon. Um, uh, you guys have been working hard and this being my first budget through, uh, I never expected it to be this uh, crazy, but um, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's an interesting time. Um, being a small business owner, uh, I know what a lot of people are going through uh, in terms of their, their own uh, economics at home. So I also, you know, have the utmost respect for educators. Uh, my entire family is, are all educators. So I, I, I get uh, the important role they have uh, with the students. And uh, the reason I never became an educator is because I don't have the patience and I don't have the skill set as my sisters and my mother and my grandmother did. But um, I, I really appreciate everything they do for us. Um, having said all of that, as everybody said, th these are unprecedented times. And I've been looking at the, um, I heard, I guess, from the Connecticut Department of Education today, uh, you know, what they're starting to look at for the fall is, even if we do our back in, in the fall, there's going to be a lot of changes. And, and when you hear changes, that also means more costs involved, too. Um, there aren't going to be a lot of savings in the fall. Uh, if anything, there's going to probably be increases from everything that I have seen. Um, and I'm just wondering, you know, when, we, when we do this budget now, what's going to happen in the fall when additional things start happening that whether you have to make smaller class sizes to keep the six foot distancing, um, you know, you're going to have to add more bus routes because you have to do more, more flex schedules and stuff like that. So I just was wondering, are you projecting that? What do you, I know it's hard to look at that and I know you've already kind of answered some of that, but um, just wanted to hear what you guys had to say on that. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Walsh. And I, you know, this is part of the unique challenge. And, you know, I appreciate that, you know, on both sides of the street, there's a lot of baptism by fire going on for folks new to this role. But frankly, this is unprecedented for any of us. You know, Mr. Slocum, uh, you know, others have had extensive experience and never seen anything like this. So um, this is a, a very, uh, you know, as we've said before, unprecedented situation. And part of what makes it so challenging is the just the dynamic nature of it and how much things change. Uh, I just want to clarify the information that you may have seen today put out about social distancing and uh, set two tiers of school and stuff. That did not come from the State Department of Education. It came from the Connecticut Association, uh, Education Association, which is the, the state teach, one of the largest state teacher unions in, in Connecticut. Um, and, you know, I, I don't think any of that was terrible guidance necessarily, but it certainly wasn't official either. So um, we are kind of uh, slaves to the medical situation right now. And as that evolves, we're going to need to evolve with it. And I, I don't disagree with you that um, it's more than likely to come at some expense. As I said before, you know, social distancing and, and school maintenance, um, I, I think a reasonable person could project that, that would go up, um, you know, in terms of the demand. So, uh, yeah, we are monitoring that closely. I had uh, one other question because I'm trying to figure out, you know, with projections and I, you put up, uh, I think that there was going to be an increase over the next five years in enrollment. And I, I know that there are different companies that have different uh, projection schedules because I've seen where you know, I, I know in the past five years, I think we've lost about 8% enrollment, but I've also seen that in the next five years, Connecticut's going to lose about 12% more enrollment, yet we're going to be the ones going up. Um, and uh, do you look at other, um, other groups that do that? And how much of the increase in enrollment does that come to when you're deciding on what kind of budget you're, you're planning for for the future? Yeah. You know, in terms of budget planning, um, we don't have to look very far out into the future, thankfully. Um, but in, you know, within the scope of, for example, our school modernization planning, uh, that is a pretty important piece. And so next week, you know, when we meet with a couple of folks that have submitted RFPs to be project managers for school modernization, and I know, you know, the coronavirus has certainly altered the the 
perspective on that as well. And I don't mean to suggest the assume that we're moving forward at laser light speed with, with this, but um, you know, other, we are, we had hoped to pursue other organizations to look at enrollment for the longer term. Um, right now though, under the circumstances, I don't know that that's uh, where we really should be investing our money. That wouldn't be my, my recommendation. Okay, and one, one last thing, I think this might go within, uh, you said that we haven't negotiated um, the contract with the buses yet for, for what is happening this year, or have we? Correct. We had a, uh, an agreement with the bus company for this year that obviously was enforced throughout uh, into early March. And then when uh, the COVID situation arose, the governor issued an executive order that uh, school systems had to pay for the daily rates, the daily runs. So we're not, you know, automatically off the table came stuff like all the field trips that we do and the athletic events and things. And those are obviously revenue generators for the bus companies. And, you know, part of the rationale for the, the governor's uh, executive order was that if all these bus companies go out of business, we're in big trouble um, as, as a society. So we did need to try and make sure that they're solvent. Um, we're in the process of finalizing the negotiations around that executive order. And we um, are examining this from a lot of different perspectives. Uh, I know Mr. Smith, Al Smith, uh, our, our attorney was on the call. We've asked him to look at uh, our agreement. We're uh, comparing with other municipalities to make sure that we're getting a, an appropriate deal and also including some of the other things that we think are important. For example, they, they employ a bus manager who's been worth her weight in gold for us. And, our, and you could ask a myriad of parents who've called the, the, and, and the things we've worked out. So we need to make sure that she's employed as part of that executive order and the money that we're paying. So, you know, we're trying to finalize that now. Um, and it has been said that would represent significant savings. That, by the way, is already incorporated into the money that we, we've suggested we'd be saving uh, in coronavirus money. All right, thank you very much. Sure. Thank you, Councilman Walsh. Mr. Grippo, I saw your hand up. Did you have a question? I did. Uh, actually, my question was for Mr. Jazcott, uh, and I don't expect him to actually have this information on hand. Uh, and I was wondering if uh, at some point Mr. Jazcott could supply to the council and to the board, um, sort of like uh, what happened to the grand list and what happened to revenues um, after the, the 02 and 08 recessions. Um, my guess would be that perhaps there was min minimal impact in, in year one, which is what we're talking about now. It would be interesting to see what had happened in years two and three so that we could perhaps make, make better decisions now to sort of flatten the effect of what might occur in years two and three. And, uh, or perhaps that's already available somewhere. And if, if that could be pointed to, I'd appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, I think it was on page 15 of our budget book. Uh, you could take a look at that for starts, but uh, I'll, I'll check too, because uh, I'm not sure if we go back quite that far. So we can follow up with that information. Thank you. Are there, all right, other questions or comments? Uh, Mr. Perugini. Yeah, also the board, but also the town council had their hand up. I don't want to cite stuff. I, uh, so David, while you, I, when you asked earlier about uh, what could change looking at the next year, I forgot to add something. I don't, know, I don't know if Jeff addressed it in his PowerPoint, but in our finance committee meeting this past Monday, we did ask about enrollment. And I think Jeff iterated that, you know, come late May, definitely June, you might have a better indication what enrollment might look like in the fall. Is that still correct, Jeff? Yeah, the later that we go into the school year, the better sense we'll have. And I think you made an astute point earlier about hearkening back to 12 years ago with that recession and, and that changing private school options for people. Um, I think that's something that we're going to want to continue to monitor as we roll into the summer. Yeah, the point is that can go up or down, but I, you know, I, I assure you as soon as we get that detail, I'm sure the town council will get that as well. Hopefully there's something positive there. I just want to make one point, you know, Don, uh, well, town council and Walsh, I still need to call you Councilman Walsh, but 
my good friend Don uh, asked a good question about, um, or was it Peter, as well, what's going to happen in the fall? So the point I made to the board Monday night, uh, I only make this as my opinion. I work in a uh, very data-driven space, and especially drug pharmaceutical side of, of healthcare, where we look very closely at drugs, what they do, therapeutic class, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Long story short, there is no cure for COVID-19, and there is no vaccine at the moment. And I bring this up because in a normal, if there's such a thing, course of events and vaccine development, there's usually trials, multiple trials, and then you know, 18 to 24 months, sometimes a little longer, a vaccine is made to the general public. We're not even at that point. And uh, so just keep that in the back of your mind when we talk about schools opening back up, um, I fully expect that the State Department of Education, uh, our epidemiologists, CDC, uh, as long as our local trust account, more, more than likely put some guidance on uh, basically, you know, how many kids we're going to have next to each other. Vincent mentioned the possibility of PPE equipment um, because even for those folks that had the virus that didn't know, or for those that had the virus that had to be treated, in the cases where those the folks developed antibodies, the medical community still can't say for, for certain that if you've developed an antibody, you're immune. And if you are immune, is it a year, two years? In essence, we don't know if this is going to come back. So I, I, I'm a little cautious about fully opening in the fall. I do expect some restrictions, but I say this because I also want to be prepared that if things do go south, if there is a, um, you know, a resurfacing of the virus, um, you know, just keep that in the back of our minds. It's, uh, you know, it's going to be very touchy. Uh, and yeah, that was pretty much it. So hopefully I Got you a little more hope on the changes for uh, enrollment, uh, David. Let's see where that goes. Yeah. Thank you for the follow up. Um, I see Mr. White's hand. Thanks. Thank you, Dave. Um, you had said earlier, if I recall correctly, Dave, that in the past three weeks, about a thousand Cheshire homes out of eight or nine thousand have gotten on, on, on enrollment. Is that I'm no, just not on, on unemployment? Not, a thousand sorry. people in Cheshire have filed for unemployment. That's equivalent to, you know, oh, it's, if it's one per household, it's equivalent to 10% uh, of our town or more just in sure. the last three weeks. Do you know what it is? Because it started probably like, I think the unemployment really hit the skids six or seven weeks ago. Do you happen to know what that is? I don't. Uh, they, okay, okay. They, That's true. Man. Details didn't matter so much to me. It was the fact that yeah. it was an image of the the uh, terrible economic conditions that are out there, and and the drive to find savings in the budget. I, yeah, I don't no, have I the specifics, but I, I think it is in the information we were sent. So if I find it, I'll forward it to you. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you, Dave. Yeah. Are there other questions or comments? If not, what I will do. Um, is no, I see. okay. Hello, okay. Councilman Oliver. Thank you. Quick question, or uh, maybe not so quick, but uh, we're talking about what might happen come the fall, uh, and how the uh, how the fall restart of school may be impacted. Um, what do you see budget wise? If in fact we go, we have a problem uh, where where we go back and. Uh, and either we have to deal with, you know, social distancing concerns, PPE costs, lots of other things, whether it's busing. What contingency are you factoring into your budget at this point? You know, what what expenses, if if the current budget doesn't meet those goals, how much more do you think that that cost would be? And also, is there a certain cost if you start going into a whole new school year? Where the where everyone is still learning from home. I mean, obviously we've had we've been dealing with this for you know uh, a month or so, a couple of months. We're ultimately you know, and I and I appreciate how quickly you got this off the ground. I, I did I was surprised uh, how quickly it got moving and, and and got into this. But starting a whole new school year is going to be a whole new process. Uh, even though we've had some experience with it, it's going to be a much bigger deal if we really are committed to potentially going into a new school year uh, with learning from home still. So what kind of additional costs do you think that would, we might see uh, that aren't contemplated in your budget now that if, if coming to fall, we'd have to obviously 
look into potentially adding potentially a significant amount to the budget predictions that you have. So I know you may have gone through them, but I'm just trying to get a better feel for how much more than, than we have now would we be seeing if, if we have to run into either one of those two contingencies where we continue to stay home or we go back with a lot of uh, additional expenses as a result of, uh, uh, you know, uh, PPE and also distancing. Right. Well, uh, thank you. I think you and Don both acknowledged how quickly our, our team was able to get the remote learning off the ground. I, I really appreciate that. A lot of folks worked really hard to make that happen. Uh, and it started with our kids and our, our community being so responsive um, and getting the supplies they needed to be successful. Um, in terms of the question about the cons uh, you know, contingencies, you know, I think I'll start to get into more of that next week. You know, I, I think what we would want to try and do is uh, be measured in what contingencies are we looking at and then what's the associated cost for that. So if we were to say, all right, is a contingency, let's say that uh, we had to uh, provide two bus runs per day in order to, you know, reduce social distancing. Um, I wouldn't suggest that. I'm just using that as a uh, uh, you know, one factor potentially, then we would uh, evaluate the associated cost for that. Um, what if we had to, you know, cap class sizes in a traditional room at, at 12? What would that look like in terms of the fiscal contingency? What if we had to provide masks and face shields to all employees and students? What would that contingency cost look like? Um, as, you know, we, we mentioned next week, I'll, I'll start to work with the New Haven region folks to start to uh, discuss what these contingencies may look like and then better evaluate. I, I think Vin is uh, uh, the president of, president, uh, not president-elect, the past president of CASBO, the Connecticut Association of, of School Business Officials. There's nobody better um, at going through this stuff. And, you know, I, I know we would work with him to try and help us evaluate what are the, the implications. And I apologize, Ben, I think I got your, your title wrong. I know you're the president. Hmm. I'm a media past president. Kind media of a, past president. Has Sorry. been president right now. But I'm still serving on the executive board. If I'm for any of this, however, we would start the 2020 year like we do every school year where we do have a cap that we do not allow our department heads and our principals to spend above. So for all our non-payroll lines, replacement equipment, new equipment, textbooks, instructional supplies, certain technology line items, you know, we start the year and we let it, our um, managers know they cannot exceed more than, generally we start 60%. So they cannot spend more than 60% of their non-payroll line items until we authorize them to go above that. And you know, round numbers, it's probably about a $2 million um, uh, total budget allocation that I'm talking about. So that's how we manage our budget every year. You know, this year, you know, is gonna present some unique challenges. Uh, those are, again, those are, in a normal year, we start at 60%, then we raise it to 70%, Usually by November, we'll raise it to 80% as we get into April, um, which is where we are now. Um, and we're, now we're gonna stop at, you know, we've told our administrators we're not going above 80%. So that's how we would start next year. And, you know, certainly work to try to live within the budget. Now we're talking about reducing the budget and there's a lot more work that needs to be done, you know, not only based on tonight's discussion, but other things that you know, we've talked about with the finance committee. Um, so we could manage to a certain extent if the cost gets, you know, really excessive, then, you know, I'm sure this group will reconvene and we'll try and figure something out. I Just a comment to that, I would find it hard to believe that we would be directed at the municipal local level to uh, have to provide all of this uh, protective gear and not have something provided from the state or the federal government for help with that. So, I mean, I think that's a realistic and, and reasonable bet to make that uh, we'd be safe that if there was such an expense like that that was to come up, that there would be at least some significant help from the state or directly from the federal government through the state to help with that expense. 
I'm not sure we have to budget for that. But all right, are, I don't see other council members with. Are there other council members with question, Mr. Orris? Did you have your hand up? I did, but I don't want to get in front of anyone else. If uh, other council members would like to ask questions, I've had enough. Yeah, I I didn't see any others, um, and I'm flipping through a lot, so I think we're ready I, for you, sir. Okay, yeah, I, I appreciate it, and I, I just want to remind everybody. I know Mr. Massiana just mentioned about you know we're discussing cutting budget. What we're talking about is reducing the requested increase of the current budget. Uh, so, you know, and I want to make sure everyone understands that because I don't think we're going to get to a point where we're reducing the budget from where it currently is this year. Uh, what we're trying to figure out is how we minimize the impacts everywhere. And obviously at this point, we're talking about the Board of Ed. Uh, but, you know, in an effort to achieve the zero mill rate increase still can provide for an increase in the in the board of ed budget as you said earlier mr Barwe, and, and i assume that's probably where we're going to end up um, i think we can accomplish a zero mill rate budget and still provide the services that we all expect uh, none of us and i certainly am one of them that's not looking to lay people off increase class sizes um, and take fundamental services that our kids need in the classroom. All of us understand the importance of our educational system and the value of our school system relative to our community. Many people move to this town mainly because of the quality of our school system. Our property values are a lot predicated on the quality of our school system. So we get that and the town council takes that very serious. Uh, but in light of the pandemic, as I said earlier, you know, we, we have some tough choices to make. And I do believe we need to protect those most vulnerable in our community and many businesses who are just shuttered right now and maybe shuttered for a long time. So how do we accomplish all of this? Labor, as I said, is one of the big places. And we're going to talk about this over the next couple of weeks. Uh, but that leads me to a couple of other questions that may help us get to you know, not talking about increased class sizes and laying people off, et cetera. Uh, Mr. Massiana, uh, you're probably the best person on this. The medical trust fund, I know we've talked about it. I know you made some projections as to how much you want to add uh, to the medical trust fund uh, in this next budget. Can you just give us an update on that and see if there's any other leeway we might have relative to use of some of those funds? Sure. Uh and I'm going to top line this. The, the original recommendation to the board was to um, add about $680,000 to the medical benefits line. Most of that would be going toward the um, contributions for medical claims. But I just want to point out part of that was also anticipating that we would have an increase in our stop loss premium, which is part of the medical benefits line. So. The reason that the request was at $680,000 is right now, our claims are averaging round numbers. Um, we expected them to average about $750,000 per month. We're contributing about $681,000 per month. So we're, we've been underfunding our claims by about $90,000 per month was the projection because we had a reserve balance as we entered the year of about three and a half million dollars. The $680,000 requested would have evened up our expected claims with the contributions that were going in so we wouldn't further erode the medical benefits reserve fund. So what happened over the course of the last few months since the, since the board approved its budget is we've had some very high claim months. Our medical benefits reserve stands at about $2.5 million, which is roughly three months of reserves. So the board did approve and what's included in the, in the council's budget consideration is $350,000 towards medical benefits for next year. Because of the run rate that we're seeing with our claims, you know, I, I would suggest that we don't wanna cut that line because I think if we do, and claims continue at this relatively high rate, we're gonna to continue to erode that reserve fund even faster. Um, so that's kind of a thumbnail uh, answer. One of the things that we don't know is, you know, what's the overall impact of COVID-related claims as we go through 
the next few months, and then all of next year. Um, there's some debate as to, you know, are claims going to actually start dropping because with COVID, a lot of elective surgeries and procedures have been put off. Um, and, and it, you know, I think the consensus is there may be an overall drop in medical claims, but, you know, one to 2%, nothing substantial. So. And, and thank you. I, I know you don't have your crystal ball um, and you, it's too early to tell what the lack of these, um, you know, kind of non-emergency uh, services does to our claim rate because it's too early to tell, but all of these, these the non-emergent services, if they're not being done, what that does to our claim rate. I'm assuming we're gonna see a reduction, but I also assume, and correct me if you think I'm wrong, that we may see a rebound of that at some point when we can open things up and people start doing those elected surgeries or whatever they put off. And do you think we'll also have the potential because of the COVID uh, related stuff to increase that. So I, I know this is a dicey area, but every year we need to look at this and kind of take a shot at it and say, okay, where do we think we need to be? Because it is a place that we can manipulate some of the dollars. Yeah. Again, I think that, you know, our reserve is okay right now. I, I wouldn't, I, I would try and avoid anything to further erode that because we just don't know. Um, okay. So, um, the next question I had is really relative to um, filling current vacancies. And I know uh, Mr. Solon got into it a little bit, but uh, can you just give us a brief overview? And I don't want to take too much time on this about, you know, positions that haven't been filled. And, 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 and it seems like if they haven't been filled, we're probably getting by without them. And, and really the anticipation of some new positions. I know we talked about there are some new positions in the budget. Uh, you explained why they're important to the school system, but you know we may have to look at some of these things as getting by as we currently are. And I'm wondering if you can just elaborate on kind of where we are relative to you know filling vacancies, hiring freezes, um, and what happens if we don't pursue some of these budget projected um, increase in employees. Well, I'll, I'll add just one piece of information first. One of the um, one of the new budget requests is twenty thousand dollars for. Uh, it's actually two twenty thousand dollar requests to add a hall monitor at Chapman and at Norton School, and that's related to uh, the establishment of these person traps, which actually I I know is on the agenda for this evening. Um, but the recommendation that's coming before the council this evening, Norton would not be one of the schools that we did in 2021. So we could take that one of those $20,000 positions out. Um, so that, that is you know, knowledge that I have right now. The other thing as to you know, open positions that we have now, we haven't been filling any open positions because of the mode that we're in. We haven't, haven't needed to. But um, you know, as we go through the rest of you know, May and June, based on you know, the retirements, as Mr. Solon or Dr. Solon said, we have four retirements. Um, unless we're you know, changing what we do, I would anticipate filling those. And I'll, I'll let Jeff address the other uh, positions that have been requested in the budget, which are two special ed and a BCBA. Yeah, I guess I'm trying to get at, because I don't want to belabor this, Vin, and thank you for that. I'm trying to get at, you know, I, obviously, if we have four teacher retirements, you want to replace them, because that obviously impacts class sizes, et cetera. But, you know, I'm not looking to pick on a department, but let's assume you, you, you have a maintenance person that retired, and maybe you haven't filled that position yet. Uh, do you have to fill that position quickly? I know we have a situation on the town side where we have a police officer, we're down an officer. Uh, it doesn't look like we can replace that officer very quickly, even though it was originally budgeted, we probably can get some savings because that position may not be filled, um, you know, for the immediate future. So I'm just trying to get at what opportunities exist in the school system that you can get by without impacting services greatly where you may currently have unfilled positions, if any. Yeah, yeah we usually employ that strategy. Um, right now, I, I, new positions for next year, we haven't started any of that stuff but each individual position that comes up now 
is either approved by me or Vin as being a critical replacement. And if it's not, then yeah, we, we often try and defer it to recoup some savings. Um, and every time an open position comes up, we evaluate the need for it. But um, yeah, we've, we've been trying to do that. There's nothing I would put my finger on today that's, that falls into that category, but it's always changing. Okay, thank you. All right, sensing that we are ready to move to an important part of our budget workshop, and that is hearing from the public and getting the, uh, uh, the getting on the record the many comments that we have received. I would now hand it over to Ms. Talbot and ask her to put on the record those who have uh, uh, sent in comments so that we can have that uh, as part of the record. Okay, well, thank you, Mr. Borowie. Um, we have, I have here 21 comments that have come in through our comments email. And the last one was at 752. And there are no other new ones here. So I think I have them up to date. Um, because there are so many of them, I have taken the liberty um, of abbreviating them and getting, hopefully I get the message across. You will all each receive a copy of these emails as well. They've all been forwarded to you. There's a couple that will be forwarded forwarded to you after this meeting. So I apologize in advance if I've, um, if I've uh, harmed the language of, of some of these, uh, of these comments and I thank everybody for sending them. Lindsay Abramson, CHS softball captain. Oh, uh oh, oh boy. Did I just go out for a sec? You did. Okay. You're reading um, Lindsay's comments. Lindsay's comments, coaches are working virtually to serve the respect of being paid. Rick Floyd, coaches are providing virtual meetings and feedback. They are great role models and they deserve to re be paid. Again, I am, I am in the interest of brevity, brevity summarizing these. Some of these are, are long and well-written and well-thought-out comments. Pete Trevelding. Uh, Coach Devin has been engaging all his teams, creating a competition that is now scaled up nationally. We don't want to lose this role model. Please reconsider cutting coaches' pay. Mark Thompson. Coaches have been engaging their teams through teleconferences, webinars, virtual competitions. They should at least receive partial pay or consideration for. Jill Buds Budzanowski, Whaley, supports no cuts for the Cheshire Public Schools budget. Um, we now understand that teachers are heroes and they deserve to be paid, even if it means higher taxes. Education should not be sacrificed to keep a mill rate low. Tony DiDemizio, coaches have been performing daily check-ins, videotape workouts, team chats, virtual competitions, and have served as mentors. They were told to carry on and they should be paid. Tracy Benjamin, coaches have been supportive and involved. Coach Devin has, oh, Coach Devine. I apologize, um, has provided daily workouts and challenges which help these athletes deal with being stuck at home. I think we lost. Yeah, I went Wait. out again, didn't I? Yeah, You're back. You're back. Tony Diodemizia, uh, Tracy Benjamin, please keep the coach's efforts and support continuing to provide support, virtual coaching, assisting with college recruitment demo videos, and have helped the athletes mentally. They've work, been working and should be comp compensated. If instructional assistants are paid, these staff should be paid. Robert Glover, coaches have been working and were asked to step up. They may have spent more time. They've been emailing, hosting video conferences, creating motivational videos, and are there for our student athletes to listen and help them cope. While keeping the mill rate unchanged is prudent, in these extraordinary, extraordinary financial times, it is requested that the schools find a way with other savings due to closures to return the stipends to the spring coaches. Candace Santiago, coaches have gone above and beyond in spite of no physical contact with their teams, and I hope you can find a way to pay them. Gracie Hemstock, a junior at Cheshire High, coaches work hard all year long, not just during the season and are in daily contact with our teams, both for training and our well-being. Being, they deserve to be paid. Sherry Hemstock, coaching is a year-round commitment. Coaches are role models, and they teach more than simply a sport. 
ask for reconsideration and for their salaries not to be cut. Lauren Strange Watkinson, parent, CHS alum and former Cheshire teacher, now a professional coach, is asking the board to reconsider the budget adjustments and not cut the spring coaching staff salary in 2020. They are putting forth a huge effort to keep athletes motivated and connected, spirits of the girls up. Additionally, their compensation was in the budget. Brian Lopez, Dodd science teacher, recognizes that these are difficult times, however, strongly advocates for the council and the board of ed to agree on a budget request that minimizes the impact on our greatest resources, re resource in this town, which continues to be our children and to ensure the best possible education for them. Zoe Dolan, the coaches have been reaching out and they do so during off season as well. They deserve their stipend as it was budgeted for. Um, Jenna, oh, I have it duplicating. Jenna DiGennaro, um, Coach Levine has been holding Zoom meetings with the team, has coordinated workouts, reached out individually, and it is unfair for the spring coaches to have their salaries cut. Mary Burnham is concerned that cuts to the Board of Ed budget will increase class sizes. Low student teacher ratios are now even more important to catch up after the impact of the virus. Uh, John Bester uh, supports the school budget request. He attended the budget workshops and found the discussions forthright and he feels that now's the time to reward school staff who have risen to the occasion doesn't want cuts to make education recovery more difficult, has been critical of the BOA at times, but supports this request. And Nick Masit, coaches should be paid. Pay doesn't come close to the hours that they put in. They have been keeping kids engaged. Uh, Coach Levine has dedicated a ton of time to youth training during the pandemic. And if you'll excuse me, there is one more. And... Nope, that's just a received message. So that is it for now. All right, thank you for that. Uh, and report. and I will be sending, I will send this to our clerk so she will have the information, Marilyn, and um, we will post this summary um, on the website as well so people can review it. Thank you, Ms. Talbot, appreciate that. Um, all right, so we are at the end of the, uh, education workshop Mr. Barr, portion. I think, I think yes. Mr. Talbot has a question. I'm sorry, or, or uh, I missed that. Yes, Councilman Talbot. Thank you, Mr. Barrowy. Um, just wanted to, to say that 90% uh, of those um, we had received prior to this meeting an email. Um, it sounds like there were a couple that came in. So we did have the ability to read a, a good, we have individually received as council people. Um, I'm curious as to, you know, having just heard this for the first time in the last couple of days, where was the um, breakdown in communication if this was agreed on with the union on March 12th? Why is this all of a sudden just an issue six weeks later? I, I can't tell you that I'm positive. I am meeting with the union president tomorrow, though. All right, thank you. Uh, Mr. Orris? Yeah, I just wanna thank everyone for sending in their comments. Obviously we're, we, we have read them all or will be reading them all and digesting all of your thoughts relative to the budget. Uh, we did all receive a lot of comments regarding these, these spring uh, coaching issue. Uh, I just wanna be clear to the public, the town council has no statutory authority to dictate how the Board of Ed spends their money by line item. Uh, our only job as a council is to provide a total budget number to the school system and the Board of Ed and their staff then dictates how that money is spent. Uh, the town council had no role at all in making the decision as to who should be paid, not paid with the current budget. Um, it is a bit surprising to me, as Mr. Talbot suggested, that there was a memorandum of understanding that, that clearly laid out what the roles would be going forward. Uh, evidently that was not clearly communicated to these poor coaches. Um, and for some reason, it appears to me based on the plethora of phone calls and emails that I received, 
uh, from members of the community and parents um, that these coaches thought they were being paid to do a service on behalf of these kids. And um, I find that troubling uh, because in these times we should have clear communication. Everybody's struggling. These coaches have a lot to do and they do pour their heart and souls into their efforts on behalf of our children. And I would just want to say, I have no role in this, uh, but if they thought they were being paid and they were told they were going to be paid and now they're not being paid, I think that's a problem. Um, what we've asked as a council is to find savings in the current budget. Um, we have been provided those savings based on what are actual savings as a result of the COVID situation. Um, it's clear to me now that there may be some issues with some of these potential savings that have been provided to us by uh, Mr. Solon and his staff. So what I would ask is, uh, can you make sure you take another look at these and let us know if there are any other issues within these savings that you've provided to us uh, relative to confusion or miscommunication or what have you, because again, we have no role in this and we're not trying to have a role in it, but we wanna be able to rely on uh, your numbers as we begin to deliberate as to what the final budget number is uh, for the Board of Ed. And so I feel bad for these coaches because I've had kids go through the school system. They do pour their heart and soul into these kids and they play a huge role in the development of our children uh, beyond just what the teachers do in the classroom. And so if they were miscommunicated to, you know, I, I just wanna say on behalf of the town council, I'm sorry that happened. Uh, it was not our issue, but uh, nonetheless, I'm sorry it happened. So. Um, I just want to ask the Board of Ed to take another look at these line items and, and try to be a little more certain as to whether we have some issues relative to some of these savings. All right, with that, um, I'm actually going to turn it back to you, uh, Mayor Orris, to run the rest of the council meeting because this portion of the budget workshop part of the meeting is over and yes. move it on to you. Yes, thank you. And thank you for all the questions and presentations, et cetera. We're going to move on to a couple of town council items quickly. And then we're going to go into an executive session that will include all of the Board of Ed members that are here, uh, a number of staff, and certainly the town council to talk about uh, personnel negotiations. Uh, but the two items next, which is item six, is a discussion of possible award of bid for $874,846 to hire Jay Rosa for construction for the school security improvements. Uh, district-wide made entrance improvements to Chapman School, Dodd School, and Cheshire High School uh, project. Uh, we have a couple of resolutions, uh, which I'm not going to ask to be read at the moment because the, I really wanted these on the agenda for conversation amongst us council members. Uh, uh, Sean Kimball asked, I think, a day or so ago that, you know, he get this in front of the council um, and looking for guidance as to how to manage these two projects. Uh, we have had some deliberations in the past on, on, on these two projects and we, in an effort of timeliness, we just need to address them. So I wanted to make sure they were on this agenda tonight so we can have a conversation as a council to decide whether we want to advance these two initiatives or not. And if not, what we want to do with them. Sure, yeah, and in the interest of time, I'll certainly, I know we have George uh, Nowatney, who is our public works director and liaison to PBC. Uh, this is a PBC project, but also Ben Massiano is uh, very involved in this project as well. So. Um, I don't know which of you gentlemen would like to take it. George, do you want to just kick it off? Sure, sure. Uh, thank you. I'll, I'll try to be very brief, as Chairman Orr said. Um, this this first project is a um, is a project for uh, school security improvements, uh, district wide main entrance improvements at Chapman School, Dodd School, and Cheshire High School um, for eight hundred and seventy four thousand dollars, eight hundred and seventy four thousand eight hundred forty six dollars. Um, this was a bid by the Public Building Commission. Um, endorsed by the council to go out to bid um, and to to get numbers for six entrances at, at various schools. Um, when the bids came back, it, it was realized that there could probably be those three schools done this year with the available funding. Um, two bids were received. Uh, one was a, a partial bid, I'm going to say that the bidder only bid on two locations and the second bidder bid on all six locations. Um, so the, the bidder that bid on all six locations, J.A. Rosa Construction, um, was deemed to be the low bidder either, either way for, for any of the locations. Um, they were scoped out by, our, by the uh, designer of record, which was uh, Friar Architects, and uh, 
they are being brought before the council as as Chairman Orr said for discussion and possible action. Uh, so, so with that, I guess I'd open it up to questions. Uh, I have some thoughts and some comments, but I'll certainly wait and delay that until we hear if uh, the rest of the council has any questions or comments. Mr. Orr. Yes, uh, Mr. Messiana, thank you. I, I just wanted to add that uh, both the projects that are up for discussion do have grant awards associated with them. The uh, school, school security, the 874,000, that would be a 41% reimbursement through a school security grant and the million twenty nine thousand dollar project has a 43 percent reimbursement grant from the um, Connecticut Department of Education the, the grant piece of this was uh, understood by everyone and Mr. Massiana just to be clear I see Mr. Slocum has his hand to be clear on the grant in order to qualify for the grant it, we as a community need to ensure that this was competitively bid is that correct that correct and they both were no I, I understand that uh but i guess my point is if we wanted to pursue other options um if the council so desired in order to ensure we maintain that that reimbursement or grant from the state we would then have to continue with another competitive bid is that correct yes thank you uh mr slocum uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my question, uh, Vince, was, uh, is there a timetable on the grants? Uh, in other words, are they time sensitive? Are they going to follow it if, uh, if, say, this is delayed for whatever reason or another? Would we, would we be eligible for the grant next year? Are there any things, any reasons that is going to make it totally compelling that we would have to, uh, you know, go forward even with only one bid? No. Well, you could, these grants would um, Carrie, if we push these projects out till next summer, or if we did portions of the project this summer and next summer, either way, well, we still would qualify for those grants. Okay, and, and as a follow-up question, uh, I recall uh, when George made a presentation, I believe at our regular meeting uh, almost a month ago, um, the doorknobs were were an issue. Were an issue. I think some of the some of the entrance type material uh, might have been a supply issue. Um, you have any more detail on that, George or or Vince? Uh, that that also makes a compelling case to to do this now when we don't necessarily know we're going to get the doorknobs all in. Sure. Um, on this one, we we asked for a, an updated schedule from Jay Rosa. Um, again, the, who was deemed the, the low, the lowest and only, well, the lowest bidder in this case. Um, and they, they did give us a schedule for uh, each of those three school locations. And uh, it shows that they can do the, the work. It goes from abatement through finishes and then all the pieces in between. And they, they finish up in mid, mid to late uh, August. Based on based on all their schedules, so they're confident that that they can they can get the um, all the materials. Although they are long lead times, obviously they're um, they're projecting I think six weeks uh, from ordering the the uh, the materials to delivery. And that's a recent COVID adjusted type of information. That's as of yesterday. That's soon. Okay, that's recent. Thank you. Sure. sure. Thank you much. Any other questions or comments, uh, Mr. Walsh? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, George, this is probably more for you. Um, being new to the store, and one realizes uh, I'm only bidding on two, uh, two, not six. Um, where's the breakdown there? And 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 I'm surprised that we only have really one bid on a 1.9 million dollar, basically for the two projects. Projects. Um, because I, I feel uncomfortable with just having one bid on that. And is, was there a breakdown somewhere in, in the explanation or were there more people that were interested that just walked throughs for both these projects and we had a number of uh, attendees, so pre-bid walkthroughs, which are pretty standard. Um, I, I don't have those numbers in front of me, but I wanna say there were half a dozen at each um, interested contractors. And then for whatever reason on bid day, we, we only got uh, two bidders for each, each one of these projects that we're discussing. Um, the the uh, one of the, the project, uh, the, 
the person traps one that we're discussing, um, they had the, op the option to bid all or a limited number based on their capabilities for the summer. Um, so it, one company bid two locations and one company bid six. So that's, uh, that's here, here we are. I, I wouldn't doubt we did bid this in the, the midst of this COVID epidemic. So I wouldn't doubt that that played into some of the cases for bids we got. Uh, I've, I've had discussions with folks that some of these items um, are long lead items to order for materials and their, wherever their origin is could be, could be compromised by the COVID epidemic and then still could be, I suppose, if there was an outbreak or something in, in one of these factories. So um, I'm sure that was a concern for bidders as well as they went forward. And do you see one person? I mean, I, I, again, I said I'm new to this, and, and, and to have one person just being the only bidder on something um, without having other people show any interest in it, um, you know, concerns me a little bit. Sure. Um, we, we can absolutely put it back out. I, we, we wouldn't be able to make the summer window for, for sure mm -hmm. this summer. So um, if, we, if we did that, and, and again, it's a public building commission's option at that point, but I, I would recommend to them that we go out shortly after the new year and, and get in early in the, in the queue for summer of 2021 work so that a contractor could be lined up um, and materials ordered by March timeframe, somewhere in that range. How, how long a process is it? I mean, because is there even a guarantee if we did give it out that it would be done by school? If school did start in August? Yes, the, the, the contractor showed a schedule that, and, and is, uh, is certain that he can have it done. Um, and we all know construction, con uh, construction work uh, can be unpredictable at times, but he, he's showing on paper that he can, he can get it done and he's confident uh, okay. enough to do that. Thanks, George. Sure. Mr. Jinks? Yeah, yeah thank you, Rob. Um, I, I, maybe I'm missing something. I don't know. I, I, we had talked about this project as being sort of a priority and something we wanted to try to get going this summer. Um, and the, I'm assuming the Public Building Commission has sort of blessed this, um, this bid, so I'm confused as to why we wouldn't go ahead and do it. Uh, well, we're not sure if we're going to go ahead and do it. I guess that's a question. We'll find out uh, what the answer is shortly when the council votes. But, um, I, you know, when I speak after um, everyone else has had an opportunity, I'll certainly give you my thoughts on it. Um, so uh, if, if that's a question, I guess that can wait to hear the answer on. Um, I, Mr. Talbot, did you have some? I saw somebody before raise their hand, and I don't want to pass over you. And then Mr. Barwe. Mute problems. Thank you, Mr. Talbot. Yep, I'm having mute problems. So, <laughs> um, my question actually is for for Mr. Smith. Then, is is there in any issue with us going out to um, rebid on this? There's no none of the bids, and uh, you know, in the exercise of its judgment as to what's in the town's best interest, it can uh, it can have a do over. My, my apprehension with, with voting in favor of going forward is, you know, it's a lot of things have happened since the last time we bid this. And um, the, the probably the least of which is a contractor's ability to fully deliver, not knowing whether they'll be able to get the materials. Um, but similar to, to the point that Mr. Walsh raised earlier, I would be concerned that we're dealing with one bid and not getting a true competitive bid, so to speak, when the, the one bidder on the one project pulled out, um, you know, and only bid on partial. Thank you, Mr. Talbot, Mr. Barwe. Yes, I actually uh, uh, echo what Councilman Talbot just said, that I, I'm concerned because we had just one bidder, but I'm also concerned because it, when it was bid, and I just found that out a moment ago, when we heard from George that it was bid during the COVID time, and that was a difficult time to expect to have people be able to participate in the process. And uh, uh, I think if we were to have this rebid in more normal times, I think we'd be able to do all the schools together because this even isn't doing Norton. And I think we would be able to get uh, whatever schools all needed to be done together at the same time in a more normal bidding 
environment and climate. Thank you, Mr. Barr. Are there any other questions or comments from council members? Uh, Mr. Velber? Uh, George, perhaps, or and or then uh, on this situation, uh, I, I've echoed, I echo the, the concerns that have been raised already uh, about the, the single bid and, and there was, but also my question is, if we did go out to bid, and I know, you know, we all keep asking people to have crystal balls, but there may be no crystal ball for this question, and that is, do we think that if, if, we, if we went out and rebid this again, economically, does it seem like there may, this may be a better time to bid versus when, when the, you know, the, the, the bids were put out originally? Um, you know, is, it, is, it, is it possible that we might get a better price now? Uh, maybe people may have a better idea about their, uh, their suppliers or whatever may happen or competitive bidding time. Um, I, I don't have a crystal ball, but it, it is possible. We, we get the bids three weeks ago, so we're not that far off. Um, however, the, the caveat to that is we were probably a little bit behind the curve in getting it out to bid. Um, ideally, you want to bid these summer type projects and in the very middle of winter, right after the new year, just because contractors' dance cards fill up pretty early with this kind of work, and you get your best pricing obviously when they're hungry um, and and don't have things lined up already, and and they can devote uh, a substantial amount of time to giving you the best price. Thank so you, Mr. Any question. other questions or comments uh, from the council? Um, if I see none, I guess I'll, I'll give you my thoughts. I, I have three main concerns uh, with this application. First and foremost, this council has always been very supportive of school security issues. As a matter of fact, I think we've, we've led the charge in a lot of cases relative to school security items. So this is a priority in all of our minds. Uh, however, with saying that, I have three big reservations. One, uh, the fact that we have one bidder and I have a hard time spending taxpayer dollars based on one bid. Uh, and that's going to go for this and for the next uh, application that we're going to address. Uh, number two, it was told to us when we talked about this last time, Mr. Nowotny, that uh, while the contractor has said they believe they can get this work done in the time of before school would start, if we're lucky enough to start in August, there really are no guarantees. And this COVID situation, in my opinion, has added much more risk that we could have an issue. Um, and God help us if we have this work started and it can't be finished and we have to put the kids in the building, it could provide greater security risks because we may have work unfinished and unable to lock down portions of the building or we won't have you know, certain aspects of this security work completed. I believe that's a greater risk related to the ability to complete the project in the time frame that we felt the contract called for. So that provides further risk in my mind in this whole application. So I can tell you, uh, based on that, I am not in favor of advancing this project uh, at this time with this one bid. Uh, my recommendation to the full council is that we rebid it. Uh, I think it would be um, most appropriate. We'll get better bids, hopefully, or at least more bids to test the market. And we'll be sure that the taxpayers are spending their money wisely. And uh, I think we can control the timing of the project better. And so for me, there's more risk here than reward relative to safety, and I won't support this. So we do have a resolution um, in our packet, if anyone is inclined to make that resolution, uh, advancing this project, and then we could all vote, unless there is a quorum at this point to, to take some other action. My recommendation is to not move this thing forward and to request the Public Building Commission to rebid it. That's my, that's my suggestion, but I'm open for thoughts. Or if somebody wants to advance the resolution, it's in your packet. Mr. Bowery. Mr. Chairman, I, I think we can't do nothing. I think we have to direct at, at what you said, direct right. Public Building Commission if we decide to deny this and ask them to go out to bid. So I would move that we recommend that the public, there are, that we direct the Public Building Commission uh, to rebid this project. Thank you, Mr. Barr. We do we have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Veliber. Is there any further conversation from members of the council on the, the motion that's on the table? Seeing none, uh, with that, I'll call for a vote. All those in favor to instruct the Public Building Commission to rebid this project, uh, please raise your hand. All in favor? One, 
to I'm having a hard beer with me, folks. I just want to make sure we get the count. Uh, Tim Slocum. It unanimous? It looks unanimous to me. Okay, good. Uh, Ms. Talbot, are you there? Are you paying attention to see this? Uh, it looks like it's a unanimous, uh, Mr. Talbot. Uh, so it's a unanimous that we table the uh, vote to move this forward and rebid this project with the PBC. Thank you. We're going to move on to the item uh, seven, discussion of possible award of bid for a million twenty nine thousand. And there's a typo in this. It looks like 01 to Jay Rosa for the construction of the code compliance improvements, door accessibility upgrades at Cheshire High School project. Uh, we certainly want to hear from a, a quick presentation from either Mr. Massiana and or Mr. Nowatney. In my opinion, this falls into the exact same category of what we just went through. It's one bid uh, for a large portion of the project. I personally have the same concerns uh, that I just raised on this prior one. So um, I'll be pretty consistent in where I stand on this. But I guess Mr. Nowatney and Mr. Uh, Massiana, if you'd like to make a brief presentation and I'll open it up to questions and comments from the council. Sure, I'll, uh, I'll do the easy part and then Vin can jump in if he needs to. Um, so this, this project uh, was to replace a number of doors, 80 plus doors in the high school that are not ADA code compliant. And this uh, stems from a, um, a review of the high school in, in years past by the state and, and the, the order to upgrade it to modern code standards. Um, this, was, this was bid out. Uh, again, we, we received two bids. Um, one bidder did withdraw because he left out on, a large amount of scope items. So he, he requested to withdraw his bid. Again, we're left with one bidder, same company as last time, Jay Rosa Construction, who, who, was, the, who was the qualified low bidder, um, qualified only bidder at this point. Um, and the, uh, he, he provided a schedule as well, showing that he could get the materials on site and get the work done before the, the school year. This one is much tighter to the school year, I, I think is, his last day is is around March 21st or so, so much closer to the opening of school than the the other project. But um, that's that's where we're at, and uh, I'll turn it over to Mr. Masiana if he has anything else. I have nothing else to add. I already mentioned the uh, grant reimbursement amount. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So with that, I'll open it up for questions or comments from members of the council. Nothing. So again, we have a resolution in the packet if we're so inclined to advance this request. Uh, my recommendation for the exact same reasons that I mentioned on the last project uh, is that we, we rebid this in hopes that we get more takers on the bid to protect taxpayer dollars and to ensure that we can better control the timeline um, and not provide a safety issue within the schools while we're trying to get those kids back into the schools. So uh, that's my recommendation. Uh, so we do need to have, I, I would like to have um, uh, a, a motion of something to ensure we get back to the PBC with a course of action. So, um, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, whoever wants to make a motion, Mr. Chairman, I will. Uh, Tim Slocum, I will. Yep. Uh, I will make a motion to uh, table the motion, so to speak, and move this back to the PBC for a, a bid process. Okay. Well, we don't have a motion on the table. We never okay. got to the resolution. We're just in discussion stages. So you're you're making a motion to table this uh, and ask PBC to go back out and bid this project. Absolutely. And I the only reason I said table is simply because it does show up as a resolution, and uh, you know it was presented as such. So okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Slocum. Is there a second? Second. Mr. Developer, second. Thank you. Any further comments or a discussion from members of the council? Seeing none, all those in favor? Uh, looks like the motion passes unanimously. So thank you all on that. Um, okay, I'm gonna get to my packet here. And the last item on the agenda is discussion uh, RE personnel negotiations. Uh, we are gonna go into executive session to include all of the members of the town council, all of the current members who are here from the Board of Ed, uh, town Manager Kimball, Assistant Town Manager Talbot, Mr. Jascott, Mr. Zulo, Superintendent Solon, uh, Chief Operating Officer Massiana. Um, I think, is Attorney Smith coming in? No, I don't think we'll need Okay, so not Attorney Smith. Did I leave anybody out? So moved, Mr. Chair. 
Okay, thank you, Mr. Talbot. So we'll move to the executive session to include all those people. Second, Mr. Veliver, all those in favor? Motion passes unanimously. We are going into executive session. It's my understanding, Mr. Kimball, we're gonna log out of this and then re-log in for an executive session conversation. Yeah, we are, yeah, I think we're gonna give that a whirl. I think this will be the last action, but at least this way we'll be on a separate uh, Okay, great. I think that's the safest way to do it. And I, just before we get off, I just want to thank the community for those who have listened in and listened to the budget. I want to thank all of the Board of Ed representatives that gave their presentations. And uh, obviously, we're going to continue to collaborate together to do the hard work to develop this budget. So thank you and good night to everybody. Thanks for your time. Do we need to hang up and call back in? I saw something in the email under yellow. Or we just uh, I, I think we have to leave this meeting and then re-log in under the separate login that Sean sent to us. Correct, Sean? Yeah, the, the separate link. Yeah, if we could, okay. that would be ideal. Okay, so uh, hopefully everybody has that, that second link. Yeah. Yep, and Arnett is the host of that one, so she'll be doing the admitting, whereas I was admitting on this meeting. Okay, great. Right so up. hopefully I'm we'll see you it. all in a few moments. Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> All I'm right. having terrible connection issues. All right. How do you hang this one up? Okay. There we go. Okay.